Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, this is uh, December, sorry, January 26, 2023. The time is 1 17 p.m., and we are convening the Minnesota Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Uh, today we have before the committee Senate File 73, Cannabis Provisions Modifications. And uh, before I go to the author and to the members, um, I just want to review a couple things about uh, the uh, the way today will play out and then um, uh, expectations for testimony on this bill. Uh, first of all, we usually save this for the end of a bill presentation, but I want to start actually by thanking very deeply uh, Senate uh, staff and council uh, for the diligent work that they have done under extreme pressure uh, to draft amendments to this uh, bill and also to work with us on uh, a full comprehensive understanding of the bill. Uh, so thank you to them. Uh, thank you to Senator Port for coming to the committee today to present the bill. Members, uh, this is the second of what will be 18 stops in committee for this bill, two in judiciary. Uh, and uh, all of you have in your packets um, the jurisdiction of this committee, the areas of jurisdiction of this committee uh, over this bill. I'm going to ask testifiers in particular and members as well to try to confine your comments and amendments to the areas of jurisdiction of this committee, knowing that there will be other opportunities, uh, several of them, uh, to address other areas not impacted by our work. Um, members, uh, I'm going to limit witness testimony to two minutes apiece. Uh, there are several people signed up to testify who also testified yesterday in the Judiciary Co uh, Committee. Uh, I'm going to ask those people to not repeat their uh, comments from yesterday, but try to bring, uh, again, comments that are relevant to the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, and with that, uh, I will go to Senate File 73. Senator Port, uh, your bill is before the committee. Please, uh, a quorum is present. Please uh, present your bill, and you can bring forward your testifiers. Thank you, Chair Klein. Good afternoon, members. I am really pleased to be here with you to present Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. Prohibition of cannab cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has had incredible costs for our communities, especially communities of color. We have an opportunity today to start the process to undo some of the harm that has been done and to create a system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in the market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals are to legalize, regulate, and expunge, and we're working to ensure the bill does just that. This bill is broad. It establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis and transfers the medical cannabis program to that new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis and hemp-derived consumer products, establishes plant propagation standards and agricultural best practices, as well as environmental standards. Additionally, the bill provides legal limits for adult use cannabis projects, establishes 14 categories of licensing and related fees, and legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure communities most harmed by prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry, provide grower grants, and invest in a substance use disorder advisory council. Senate File 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business development grant opportunities, sets up an automatic expungement program as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in temporary regulated changes needed for products that we legalized last year. We also provide guidelines on testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. As I said, this bill is comprehensive, to say the least. And we will have changes between now and when we see it on the floor. Over the next month or so, as the chair said, this bill will have a total of 18 stops. We have one down, so 17 to go. Uh, and we hope that through this process, we can work together with uh, each other and stakeholders and community members to get to a final product that works best for Minnesotans. We have an opportunity on the, we will have an opportunity on the floor to have a broad debate on whether 
to legalize cannabis or not, but I'm hoping that our work in committees can really focus around the jurisdictions of each committees because there are in-depth questions in these bills that we should work together to make sure we have the right answers to. I look forward to uh, working with this committee and appreciate everyone who came to testify today. Uh, let's legalize, regulate, and expunge. Thank you, Senator Port. Do you have testifiers? I do, yes. If I could ask Marin Schroeder, uh, Nathan Ratner, and Jamie Croyle to testify. And uh, Senator Port, while your testifiers come to the table, I will go to Mr. Hudala to uh, do a run through of the bill. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Given that very helpful description of the bill's primary provisions by its author, I'll actually begin with a brief overview of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee's jurisdiction over this bill. Specifically, this committee has oversight over three threshold matters within SF-73. The first area of policy jurisdiction, and the most extensive throughout the bill, is over retail sales of most products to be sold to the general public. Review over these product sales, most notably cannabis flower, cannabinoid products, and hemp-derived products, extends throughout the supply chain to wholesalers and manufacturers, and the review further encompasses product safety, certain security measures, advertising and packaging, and related licensing provisions. Second, this committee has jurisdiction over the interaction between cannabis and liquor products and cannabis and liquor retailers. In particular, this committee may review any limitations, permissions, and or prohibitions concerning sales of certain cannabis or hemp-based products at licensed liquor stores. Finally, this bill contains a handful of provisions that relate directly to the Department of Commerce as well as to insurance. These sections are not as common in SF-73 as the two previously described policy areas, but they obviously fall squarely within the purview of this committee's jurisdiction. Please note that although this overview will provide an outline of the general structure of the entire bill and will highlight certain key areas, its primary focus will be to describe those sections relevant to today's hearing as just outlined as being within the proper jurisdiction of the committee. On that note, I'll move into the bill itself, starting with Article 1 entitled Regulation of Adult Use Cannabis. All provisions in Article 1 are codified in a new statutory chapter of Minnesota law, that chapter being 342. Notably, the chapter establishes the new Office of Cannabis Management, which I'll refer to throughout the overview as OCM. By the terms of this bill, OCM will be created to oversee the regulation of cannabis flower, cannabis products, including lower potency cannabinoid products and hemp dried consumer products. The bulk of Article 1 involves the power and duties given to the OCM to oversee the new cannabis industry, including a significant number of licensing and operating provisions. Most notably, Section 10 of the bill sets forth the types of licenses that the OCM must issue under this new chapter. Those license categories are cannabis cultivator, cannabis manufacturer, cannabis retailer, cannabis wholesaler, cannabis transporter, cannabis testing facility, cannabis micro business, cannabis event organizer, cannabis delivery service, lower potency edible retailer, medical cannabis cultivator, medical cannabis processor, and medical cannabis retailer. Of all those new types of licenses to be issued by OCM, there are six which fall under this committee's jurisdiction. Those six are cannabis manufacturer, cannabis retailer, cannabis wholesaler, cannabis micro business, cannabis delivery service, and lower potency edible retailer. The bulk of this overview will be spent identifying key licensing obligations and operational compliance requirements that FS73 imposes upon these six license types, as well as attempting to clarify the primary distinctions between the various license holders. On that note, I'll first direct everybody to sections 19 and 20 of the bill, which relate to all cannabis business, not only the six types specifically enumerated above as within this committee's jurisdiction. 
Section 19 establishes general ownership requirements that apply to all cannabis businesses in the state of Minnesota. Among other criteria, Section 19 provides for a national criminal history check for all licensed applicants and prospective employees and establishes disqualifications for certain criminal offenses. In addition, a license holder must be at least 21 years old, reside in Minnesota, or if the license holder is an entity, it must be formed under the laws of the state and never had a license, a license previously revoked under this new chapter. In contrast to the provisions in section 19 outlining permissible ownership of cannabis businesses, section 20 details general operational requirements for a cannabis business. These requirements include, for example, prohibitions on hiring a person under 21 years of age to perform work involving the handling of cannabis products, prohibiting the selling or giving of cannabis flower or cannabinoid products to person under the age of 21, subject to certain exceptions for medical cannabis, and requiring the use of the statewide monitoring system. Whereas sections 19 and 20 address requirements for all cannabis businesses, I'll now move into the six types of licenses, again, issued and enforced by the OCM, but those which fall under the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee's policy jurisdiction. These begin with the cannabis manufacturer license set forth in sections 23 and section 24. Specifically, cannabis manufacturers may make cannabis concentrate, hemp concentrate, manufacture artificially derived cannabinoids, manufacture products for public consumption, package, and label cannabis products for sale to other cannabis businesses. Section 24, however, generally requires cannabis manufacturing to take place in an enclosed lock facility that is used exclusively for the manufacture of cannabinoid products, creation of hemp concentrate, or creation of artificially derived cannabinoids. A further note is that there are established approval information and notice requirements with the Office of Cannabis Management for cannabis manufacturers, as well as disclosure requirements for such manufacturers to certain buyers. Then we move on to cannabis retailers, which are detailed in sections 25 and 26. This type of license holder may generally sell immature cannabis plants and seedlings, adult use cannabis and products, and other approved products. In addition, the bill expressly permits localities to own and operate a municipal cannabis store. The operational requirements for such cannabis retailers are established in section 26 and include, among another, a number of other compliance obligations, requiring cannabis retailers to post notices announcing product recalls, warning of the dangers of driving while under the influence, and stating that consumption is intended only for individuals who are 21 years of age or older. Cannabis wholesalers are described in sections 27 and 28. Wholesalers may purchase immature cannabis plants and seedlings, cannabis, cannabis products, hemp, and hemp products from cannabis cultivators, manufacturers, micro-businesses, and industrial hemp growers. And then they may sell these products to cannabis manufacturers and retailers. These license holders are also permitted to sell cannabis paraphernalia, as well as certain products manufactured outside of the state of Minnesota, provided that those products meet the applicable Minnesota requirements and limits. Operational requirements for cannabis wholesalers mandate that they maintain separation between cannabis flower and cannabinoid products and hemp plant parts and hemp derived consumer products. In addition, cannabis wholesalers must maintain appropriate records and ensure that labels uh, remain affixed to products. Finally, that section 28 contains a notable provision that it is not a permiss permissible defense in any civil or criminal action for a cannabis wholesaler to assert that it relied on product label information or other information provided by an out-of-state manufacturer. The fourth OCM license holders under Commerce's purview are termed cannabis micro-businesses. These micro-businesses are addressed in sections 33 and 34. 
Micro businesses are generally permitted to operate across multiple sectors of the cannabis market, however, on a small, smaller scale. The operational requirements of a micro business are not uniquely distinct from the other license types detailed herein. Instead, these requirements are predominantly tied to the specific form of cannabis operation that the specific micro business is operating in its smaller scale. Moving on to sections 37 and 38, which address the licensing and operations for cannabis delivery services. In particular, a cannabis delivery service license entitles the license holder to obtain purchased adult use and medical cannabis flower, cannabinoid products, and hemp-derived consumer products and deliver them to customers. Such services must verify the age of customers and, when applicable, verify that the customer is enrolled in the medical cannabis program. OCM is directed to establish limits on the amounts of products which may be transported, and there is a mandatory entry of the delivered products into the statewide monitoring system. Finally, sections 39 and 40 address the sixth and final type of license holder within this committee's jurisdiction. Specifically, lower potency edible product retailers may only sell lower potency edible products to individuals who are at least 21 years of age. These products must be obtained from a licensed Minnesota cannabis manufacturer, cannabis micro business, or cannabis wholesaler. Notably, a lower potency edible product retailer may hold an off-sale or on-sale license for the sale of 3.2% malt liquor an on-sale intoxicating liquor license, an off-sale intoxicating liquor license, or a combination off-sale and on-sale intoxicating liquor license. Lower potency edible product retailers may not sell cannabis flower or other cannabinoid products, however. License holders must verify the age of customers and must keep products behind the counter or in another secure area. So as previously noted, the bulk of this committee's jurisdiction lies in Article 1 of the bill in front of us. These Article 1 provisions further include the packaging, labeling, advertising, and hemp-derived topical product sections contained therein. Specifically, Section 56 of Article 1 deals with the health and safety requirements as they apply to packaging of cannabis and hemp-derived products. In particular, this section provides that cannabis flower, cannabinoid products, and hemp-derived consumer products sold to consumers and patients must be prepackaged or placed in packaging at the final point of sale in packaging or a container that is plain, child-resistant, tamper-evident, and opaque. This section 56 further prohibits certain products from being sold to customers and patients in a manner of packaging that bears a reasonable resemblance to any commercially available product that does not contain cannabinoids or that is otherwise designed to appeal to persons under 21 years of age. Similarly, Section 57 governs labeling for such consumer products that are sold to customers and patients. This section identifies the information a label must contain including but not limited to information about the cannabis cultivator, micro business, medical cannabis cultivator, or industrial hemp grower that cultivated the product. Section 57 further requires certain warning statements to be included upon the labels. The final section of Article 1 that I'm going to discuss here is Section 58, which addresses advertisements. Um, these are also within this committee's jurisdiction as a result of its purview over fair and safe trade practices. This section establishes requirements and limitations for advertisements for cannabis and hemp-based consumer products. Uh, for instance, some of the requirements and limitations include prohibiting advertisements from containing false or misleading statements, containing unverified claims, depicting persons under 21 consuming cannabis or a cannabis product, um, as well, this section prohibits outdoor advertisements, although it does prohibit, permit up to two fixed outdoor signs that satisfy certain criteria. Moving now from Article 1 of the bill, I would highlight for the committee that Article 2 relates to taxes. Specifically, Article 2 provides the tax structure for the retail sale of recreational cannabis. 
Article three concerns business development. In particular, it establishes grant programs to support cannabis businesses. Article four addresses criminal penalties and article five deals with expungements for related criminal offenses. These articles do not implicate our committee's jurisdiction. However, before proceeding to Article 6, which does contain a few additional commerce-related sections, I'd like to note that in the event anyone uh, here is interested in taking a closer look at the provisions contained in Articles 2 through 5 that I just mentioned, there should be a comprehensive section-by-section -section summary uh, in all of your packets that was prepared by our entire Office of Senate Council Research and Fiscal Analysis. That packet addresses the full bill, including those items that are not within this committee's jurisdiction and thus not otherwise addressed in this overview. Moving to Article 6, which is entitled Miscellaneous Provisions. As the name suggests, this article outlines various miscellaneous provisions contained in the bill. In terms of this committee's jurisdiction, however, Sections one and two of that article authorize the governor to enter into certain compacts with Indian tribes regarding medical cannabis and adult use cannabis. As applicable here, the sections provide that the governor, attorney general, and the governor's designated representatives shall report to certain legislative committees, one of which includes the Commerce Committee. Um, in addition, section 31 permits an exclusive, uh, exclusive liquor store to now sell lower potency edible products. And then finally, um, in Article 7, which is entitled Temporary Regulation of Certain Products, it only contains one provision pertaining to this committee, which is Section 4. That section permits exclusive liquor stores to sell edible cannabinoid products. Um, and then finally, Article 9 outlines appropriations. Um, specifically, Article 9 appropriates money to pay for the bill, um, of note, subdivision one of sec uh, section one appropriates money from the general fund to the Commissioner of Commerce for the purposes of this act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudal. And uh, we will now go to testimony. And uh, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Klein and members. Uh, my name is Marin Schroeder, and I am the Coalition Director for Minnesota is Ready. Much of my job is interacting with stakeholders, including members of Minnesota's cannabis and hemp industries, to help inform policy changes and potential amendments to this bill. Of course, the folks I work with are supportive of the bill and view it as an incredible opportunity to enter an industry where Minnesota lags behind much of the country. The dedication to a thriving homegrown industry by Senator Port and Representative Stevenson is greatly appreciated by the folks I'm working with, and we look forward to refining and modernizing the licensing structure as this bill moves forward. I have also worked extensively with the Medical Cannabis Program as the Policy Director for Sensible Change Minnesota. One of the biggest concerns I've heard from patients is how the transition to full legalization will impact them, especially in light of the extreme limitations Minnesota has placed on med for the past decade. One of the biggest fears of patients, consumers, and small Minnesota businesses is that this bill will become med 2.0. Let's make sure we continue to bring a diverse set of voices to the table to craft what I believe will be the best cannabis legalization program in the country. Finally, I wanna share with the committee some data from a recent report by Cannabis Public Policy Consultants, a consulting agency established by public health professionals and former controlled substance regulators with a focus on data-driven consulting. This fall, they released a study um, that specifically when comparing cannabis-related harms across state legalization status, the current analysis revealed that states with regulated medical or adult use cannabis showed older age at first cannabis use for youth, fewer days of past month cannabis use for those 16 to 20 years old, and fewer days of driving under the influence in the past month. Notably, there were no differences observed among the three state legalization statuses in terms of overall cannabis prevalence, cannabis use disorder prevalence, and overall health status. As we continue this discussion, let's make sure that we're using reliable, objective sources and look to current data and keep our stakeholders at the table to make this the best bill in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schrader. I have listed Nathan Ratner and Jamie Croyle. Are they in the building? Yeah. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for having me here today. My name is Nathan Ratner. I am a co-founder uh, and vice president of The Great Rise. We are a 501c3 organization and coalition focused on uh, cannabis policy research and public education. Uh, we would like to commend uh, this committee for the historic step of hearing SF73, um, and it's something that deserves to be celebrated. Our goal is to ensure social and economic equity through adult use cannabis legalization. Minnesota is the third most prosperous state in the country, and we have the record for having the lowest unemployment rate in this nation's history. Yet we have the third worst racial wealth disparity in the country, worse than Mississippi, which is fourth. At the same time, 47 of the 50 poorest counties in our state are in greater Minnesota. The adult use uh, cannabis market is estimated to grow to $1.2 billion in annual revenue within the first five years and continue to grow from there. We believe that cannabis can be a catalyst for a, to establish a basis of equity in our state that will make communities in all four corners of Minnesota stronger and more resilient for generations to come. I would like to challenge this committee today to pass the most equitable cannabis bill in the country. Currently, New York's is the best model. So I challenge this committee to get some revenge and actually beat New York. Um, uh, I would like to, to rise to the opportunity and in, in the text of their bill, they commit to 50% uh, of all licenses through across the industry going to social and economic equity applicants, and they have a very thoughtful list of those. I would like to Minnesota to rise to the opportunity and commit to 60% of all licenses to a wider variety of social and economic equity applicants, including uh, expanding upon Minnesota's already strong definition in this bill to include service disabled veterans, distressed farmers, and uh, people with disabilities own businesses and employment opportunities. We have the opportunity to lead the nation and uh, we come in the spirit of collaborative partnership to get there together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ratner, Ms. Croyle. And while Ms. Croyle is testifying, can we please have Josh Wilkins Simon come to the table? Chair, members, thank you. My name is Jamie Croyle. I own a cannabis retail business located in historic downtown Anoka. My small business supports local farmers and manufacturers to bring our community locally made products. I have been a good steward of this plant since 2018 and have seen firsthand the positive impacts that has brought hundreds of my clients the help they need. Personally, cannabis has helped me through my life events, uh, lending ease at, to my already strained mental health and allowing more compassion to care for my mother and grandmother at the end of life care. It is important as a steward to this plant and industry to be present in not only the winds, but in the face of adversity and the unknown. To offer guidance and education to destigmatize what all of these clients call their medicine. In August, I approached my city council and asked if, they, if I could help structure the city's hemp licensing program. I provided education and the voice of a small business owner who would otherwise be impacted by swiftly changing laws and regulations. Today, there is an ordinance in place that best suits not only the community, but my small business as well. Consumer protection is of great importance to all of the stewards of this industry and plant. Passage of this bill will not only give consumers more medical freedom, but will regulate the strength of consumables and various products in a safe, controlled, and trustworthy environment. Focusing our efforts in creating business opportunities for those who are currently in the legacy market, the ability to create thriving businesses and have clientels that already trust them will follow them into successful businesses. As a woman in the industry, I have to fight twice as hard and speak twice as loud to make an impact. It is important that we continue to build a structure that creates equality for social equity communities, women, and BIPOC individuals. The authors of this bill have worked tirelessly to ensure that our voices are heard, and I ask that you take consideration when making decisions. 
The state has a solid community from farm to table who are passionate about enriching everyone's lives through this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Croyle. Uh, and as uh, the previous testifiers clear the table, if I could have Bridget Pinder and Sean Weber come to the table to prepare to testify. And with that, Mr. Josh Wilkins, Simon, please introduce yourself for the record and give your testimony. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for bringing this bill forward and permitting me to speak. My name is Josh Wilkins Simon. I am the owner of a small business, Legacy Glassworks, a high-end glass pipe gallery and low-potency edible dispensary with locations in downtown Duluth and uptown Minneapolis at the corner of Lake and Lindale. I am also the co-chair of the Lynn Lake Business Association. I am here today to enthusiastically support SF73. I want to thank Senator Port. Um, and I know we are under a tight schedule, so I'll keep my comments brief. In 2009, while I was attending college at Hamlin University, I witnessed my older cousin, a talented glassblower with a specialization in crafting glass pipes, being exploited by a business who did not come close to paying him a living wage, yet made incredible profits from his artistic abilities. I took $200 that I had saved up from working at Rainbow Foods and purchased a handful of my cousin's glass pipes from this business to sell at a local music festival. After the initial success of a few festivals, I had saved enough money for my cousin to quit and for us to open a small glass blowing studio in St. Paul. After graduation, I took the dive and opened my first retail store in a tiny 400 square foot shop in Duluth. In 2016, I was able to expand and open an additional store in Minneapolis. With a current total of 12 employees, I am the very definition of small business. SF73, Section 2, Subdivision 1, reads that the Office of Cannabis Management in making rules and establishing policy must promote a craft industry for cannabis flower and cannabinoid products and prioritize growth and recovery in communities that have experienced a disproportionate negative impact from cannabis prohibition. These two critical tasks can be only accomplished by supporting small Minnesota businesses over large multi-state cannabis operators. These large out-of-state corporations are already here. Recently, a foreign corporation signed six leases in the Twin Cities with the assumption that Minnesota will issue them licenses, perhaps even micro-business licenses. This is a result not intended by the bill. Large corporations will go to great lengths to make sure that they can dominate the Minnesota cannabis industry, and this will result in small businesses, especially those folks from the areas most in need of investment by local entrepreneurs, not even having a fighting chance to succeed in this new industry. Everyone knows that Lake Street has suffered tremendously. My business was at ground zero of the riots. This area, along with areas in North Minneapolis, are most in need of investment by small businesses. I'm fortunate to know the vast majority of Minnesota hemp farmers, extractors, manufacturers, retailers, almost all of which are incredibly small businesses. It's amazing to see these new, diverse entrepreneurs begin to succeed after last year's legalization of low-potency edibles. Since the start of this legislative session, my phone has been consistently ringing from these small businesses, all of which are terrified that they will be immediately pushed out of the cannabis industry by large multi-state operators. While SF73 has multiple provisions designed to promote small business, there's room for improvement. As this bill is amended, amended and moves through the various committees in the Senate, I urge members on both sides of the aisle to prioritize small business by, by protecting many of the current provisions found in this bill, while also working to add additional language to discourage large out-of-state corporations from dominating the Minnesota cannabis marketplace. I will continue to work with the small Minnesota cannabis businesses to identify areas of this bill that can be improved, and I look forward to working with Senator Port and any other members of the Senate to ensure that SF73 can become the strongest and most equitable adult use cannabis legalization bill in the country. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Simon, Ms. Bridget Pinder, please introduce yourself for the record. And Hi, I'm Bridget Pinder. Um, I am the owner of Grounded Gardens. We are a women-owned and operated hemp farm and cannabis company. Um, we are vertically integrated, meaning we grow, process, uh, make all of our products, and we also wholesale, um, do retail, and do events. Um, <clears throat> we farm 18 acres of organic land in rural Minnesota as well. I'm on the board of Minnesota Normal, the Minnesota Hemp Growers Co-op, and our business is part of the MN is Ready Coalition. As an activist for over 10 years in Minnesota, fighting for the legalization of cannabis, I am overly excited about sitting in front of you today discussing this bill. My business and all cannabis businesses begin and end with the farmers. Farmers are vital to the success of this bill and the cannabis industry. When I read the bill, I only see indoor grows and small canopy spaces talked about. If we think about one acre of land being 43,560 square feet, 
the largest proposed license wouldn't even be one acre of land. Outdoor takes less water, electricity, lights, cleans the soil, things like that, and is used for making the bulk of our hemp products currently. As hemp and THC are both cannabis, why would we, why would we grow less acres when the demand for THC will be higher than CBD from hemp? As my business stands right now, I would not fall under any of these licensing categories and would have to change my motto of following a farmer's market guideline. Minnesotans want to know what they are putting into and on their bodies through knowing their farmers. Our business is also asking that you treat us like every other farmer. Allow us to continue to participate in farmer's market and vendor shows, where we educate the public about cannabis and how it can help them. We are also a part of the Minnesota Grown Program, and we wear that logo proudly on all of our packaging. Minnesota is about supporting small businesses. And I'm asking you today to let the small businesses that have built the cannabis industry so far in Minnesota transition through modifications in the licensing structure. We see the work the authors are doing and are grateful for all of their hard work and time. We look forward to working with everybody on the changes going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Pinder. And uh, while you're clearing the table, if I could have Mr. Cap O'Rourke and Ms. Rayanne Buckles come forward. Uh, and with that, Mr. Sean Weber, could you please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony? Well, good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Sean Weber. I am the owner-operator of Crested River Cannabis Company in Morgan, Minnesota, as well as the president of the Minnesota Hemp Growers Cooperative. Um, I echo a lot of what the testimonies have, have told us um, in all chambers. Um, so I would just like to start off with a little story about rural Minnesota. Um, I'm from rocks and cows. Not so many rocks, a lot of cows. But with that said, um, when I started Crested River, uh, my number one concern was acceptance. It's traditionally conservative. Um, uh, we were welcomed with open arms in our small town, and we were able to destigmatize the idea of a cannabis operation in a small town through education. Um, we approached everything with an open mind, and in turn, we were approached with an open mind. We're talking about a natural multivitamin. And with that said, um, it's been around for 10,000 years. However, it's been prohibited for 100 once we're able to do true R&D, you'll actually see commercial and pharmaceutical utilization. This is an inevitable process. We are delaying the inevitable. The sooner that Minnesota comes online and cuts down these restrictions and implements legalization is delaying any and all industrial opportunities and commercial opportunities moving forward. But the success that I've had in Redwood County is not consistent throughout the state of Minnesota. We understand there is a need for local control and we just can't push things out. In the counties of Polk and Hubbard, we have some friends up there that are fighting tooth and nail to stay open. Even though municipal ordinances um, have not been successful in moratoriums, there are now county proposals. And so with the passage of HF or SF73, we'll be able to move forward with additional destigmatization and ensure that um, operators around the state uh, can secure their revenue and, and, um, and provide additional jobs and community engagement. With that said, I'll, I'll yield my time and I would be uh, open and available for any and all dialogue with the committee and senators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Mr. Cap O'Rourke, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Cap O'Rourke. I'm here on behalf of a coalition of um, existing Minnesota-based businesses that are currently operating in the low-dose market as both manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. Uh, with regards to Senate File 73, we have a number of businesses that are um, doing, uh, that are serving the consumer's needs with low dose products. They are supportive of the overall goals of Senate File 73. They do, however, have a number of concerns about how these existing businesses would be able to, or if they would be able to not only operate their current business model, but how they would be able to expand into the adult use uh, market. 
The bill as drafted is largely based off of um, an earlier House bill that, pa that was passed off the House floor a couple years ago. And at that time, in, in all honesty, there weren't a lot of existing businesses. And so a lot of the uh, recommendations by that bill and the regulations were on an industry that didn't exist. In a mere two years, that has significantly changed. We have a number of Minnesota-based businesses that are participating in the hemp industry, and they are significant. They have serious um, intentions to participate in the adult use industry if it is reasonable. The bill as drafted has pretty significant uh, onerous licensing requirements for these businesses, and it would, as, M as Bridget pointed out earlier, it would require a number of existing businesses to significantly change how their current business model works, and it, in all likelihood, would prevent a lot of Minnesota-based businesses from moving into the adult rec, mo uh, adult rec industry. We look forward to working with Senator Port. We appreciate her carrying this legislation and with your committee, but we want to make sure that the bill, as finally, if it finally passes, will work for existing Minnesota businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. And as you clear the table, if I could have uh, Mr. Aaron Cocking and Mr. John Hausleiden come to the table. And with that, uh, Ms. Uh, Buckles, please, Ms. Buckles, please go ahead with your testimony and introduce yourself for the record. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rihanna Buckles, and I am the Legislative and Coalitions Director for Americans for Prosperity here in Minnesota. I am here to testify on behalf of this bill and reiterate the importance of its passage. There are many aspects that we are pleased to see come to fruition, such as the flexibility with the allocation of the general generated revenue as written in Article 9. Um, we actually see that as a gold standard for other states that would like to pursue the legalization of cannabis. Um, so we certainly applaud that provision. While we are overall supportive of the legislation, we also see areas of improvement, such as overregulation. As businesses and individuals that opt to enter the market should be able to do so without overly burdensome mandates and unnecessary barriers that increase costs while inhibiting growth and innovation. It is vital that safeguards and structures are imposed, but it is also equally important that these mandates do not go above and beyond what is needed to create a functioning industry, especially in its infancy. We've also been working on a bipartisan basis um, to adjust the current language regarding the Office of Cannabis Management and the power that this new institution has to control who can operate in this market. To ensure market competitiveness and stability, we propose that the office be required to submit an annual market analysis to determine whether it is fulfilling the prescribed requirements in addition to holding public hearings to hear from consumers, market stakeholders, and potential new applicants as part of determining whether new licenses are needed to ensure such a competitive market. We believe that this element is vital to the success of legalizing cannabis and ensuring that this new government entity is acting in a fair and transparent manner. Manner. We would hate to see Minnesota follow the example of other states that have allowed um, a large handful of out-of-state companies dominate their market. Um, and we have, um, as I said, worked on a bipartisan basis, um, and so we are very much looking forward to seeing that transparency. Um, we are very much looking forward to this next chapter in our state. We view this as a step forward. Um, and where individuals can maintain their rights and freedoms and where goods and services can be available legally for commerce without the fear or restraint of prohibition. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Buckles. And Mr. Aaron Cocking, if you could introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Aaron Cocking, Insurance Federation of Minnesota. Uh, just a couple of uh, points I want to make, uh, one broad and one more specific. Uh, on the broad, uh, from the broad point of view, our industry is, is concerned about passage of this bill uh, because of the road place and workplace safety um, uh, ramifications of putting people who are impaired onto our roads and into our workplaces. Uh, we know uh, from other states that have legalized this, we will see an increase in crashes and injuries and potentially uh, potential fatalities. And until we can get a reliable roadside impairment test, uh, we think that this, uh, this legislature should, should act with caution. Now on a more specific issue, I would, I would point you to uh, page 121 of the bill as introduced, line eight, specifically um, the section dealing with uh, the prohibition on subrogation. Uh, as this committee probably knows, subrogation is a right held by insurers to pursue a third party uh, that caused an insured loss 
um, to an, an insured. Uh, I know that, that in reviewing this bill that this was largely lifted from uh, 340A.801, which many of you probably know is our dram shop insurance law. Um, and subrogation is prohibited in those circumstances because we want that money earmarked for uh, victims and people who are injured uh, as a result of someone uh, who was uh, illegally served alcohol. Um, the subrogation prohibition that exists in this bill, because we do not have uh, an equal dram shop requirement, only protects a negligent uh, cannabis retailer. Uh, so in our, in our view, we should either strike the subrogation provision or require uh, some type of equitable dram shop insurance uh, for these businesses as well. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cocking. Uh, and could I have Mr. Peter Coyle come to the table as you clear? And we'll go to Mr. John House, House Leiden. You can introduce yourself for the record, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I am John Hausladen, president of the Minnesota Trucking Association, and I'm here today to testify in opposition to Senate File 73. And while my comments today will focus uh, on the uh, comments uh, re relative to this committee, I do want to reiterate our belief that legalizing recreational cannabis will make Minnesota roadways less safe leading to more crashes, injuries, and fatalities. You just look at Minnesota roadways right now. Speeds are up, law enforcement is understaffed, and there is currently no reliable roadside test that law enforcement can use to assess impairment. How can putting more cannabis-impaired drivers on the roadway make that situation better? Uh, we believe Senate File 73 will have a negative impact on our workforce. Minnesota currently faces a shortage of nearly 8,000 professional truck drivers, while the national shortage is 10 times that number. And per federal regulation, truck drivers are prohibited from driving while under the influence of any Schedule I drug. Truck drivers are subject to drug testing, which includes pre-hire testing, random testing, post-accident testing, and return to work testing after completing a rehabilitation program. And to be clear, enacting Senate File 73 into law will not make it legal for persons to consume cannabis and drive a commercial vehicle. However, it will raise the likelihood that persons will consume cannabis and generate a positive drug test due to confusion and misinformation. And if they have a positive result, they will be relieved of duty, and the odds of that person ever driving again are low. Fundamentally, this is all about commerce, because if you look further down the road, a person who becomes a recreational user of cannabis under this law may not want to be a truck driver today, but in the future they may, and the cannabis lifestyle will make it nearly impossible for them to ever successfully pass a pre-employment drug test. But does this really happen? Well, unfortunately it does. We've already seen it with CBD, which in theory should have no THC, but bad products do make it to the market, and truck drivers have lost their ability to drive while buying what they believe was a safe, legal product. One of our concerns is the nexus between the new cannabis agency and the Department of Commerce in some of these, what I would call more gray areas, and whether or not the Department of Commerce has been given enough funding to address some of these downstream impacts. And another case in point, I have a member fleet with operations in Minnesota and Colorado, and their member reports that their ability to recruit new drivers in Colorado has become significantly harder due to one issue, cannabis. The applicants simply cannot pass a pre-employment drug test. And the Colorado Motor Carriers Association confirms that it has grown much more difficult to recruit truck drivers in Colorado. So, a long-term view suggests that our already significant driver shortage will only grow worse if this becomes law. So how does this expand to the rest of the economy? The impact will be likely the same on every transportation sector requiring DOT drug testing. So this includes airline pilots, railroad engineers, barge captains, and yes, even Metro Transit drivers. Our supply chain is fragile, as we saw during the pandemic, and truck drivers are the lifeblood of the supply chain. Our supply chain problems will only worsen if we lose more current and potential truck drivers to marijuana impacts. So the best crafted bill can't overcome the new traffic safety and workforce risks created by legalizing cannabis, and thus we urge you to vote no on Senate File 73. 
Thank you, Mr. House Leiden. Uh, and next up is Mr. Peter Coyle, and I believe you may have an additional testifier with you. Sir, could you both introduce yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am joined by an additional testifier, but he will only introduce himself, and I'll provide the primary testimony. Uh, first of all, Peter Coyle, Larkin Hoffman, on behalf of the Minnesota Outdoor Advertising Association. And I'm Nels Pearson. I am an employee at Reagan Outdoor Advertising in Rochester, Minnesota. Mr. Chairman and members, thanks very much for giving us a chance to speak to you today. I'm going to address my comments to the prohibition on the use of outdoor advertising, which is found in Article 1, Section 58 of the bill. And I've shared my comments with Senator Port so that she understands uh, uh, our concerns, but also our desire to work with her on correcting the language if possible. The Minnesota Outdoor Advertising Association is comprised of approximately a dozen advertising companies, uh, many of them multi-generational and family-owned several of which are also national in scope. Our members provide advertising services of legal products to Minnesota consumers, uh, both for companies, nonprofits, and government agencies, including many state agencies. We support your Main Street businesses, and we hope to do so as well if the product that this bill would authorize, that is cannabis, is, is allowed to go forward through retail sales activity. It's our desire to provide our advertising services to them no different than TV, radio, newspaper, and internet advertising. Unfortunately, the bill as drafted includes a flat prohibition on the use of outdoor advertising for reasons that make no sense if you, if you believe that the goal of the author and the legislature potentially is to see that this industry be successful, if legal. We'd like to help it be successful. But the prohibition on outdoor advertising makes no sense when all other forms of legal advertising in Minnesota are permitted. And so our request of the committee, our request of the author, and our request of the legislature is that you remove that prohibition <coughs> and let outdoor advertising companies compete for the business of their customers, potentially including many new Minnesota businesses, so they can help them be successful in the marketplace. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Coyle and Representative Pearson. And as you clear the table, I'll have our final three Scheduled testifiers come to the table, Ms. Alex Hassel, Mr. Justin Miller, and Ms. Miranda Gohn. Ms. Hassel, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alex Hassel. I'm here on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities, representing 837 cities across the state. We know that this bill has many committee stops to make, and the League is committed to working with the author, Senator Port, on this as it progresses. And I'll also mention that we have been working very closely with the Association of Minnesota Counties on this. And while they couldn't be here today because of competing hearing schedules, we as local governments have been working together and thinking through what a reasonable partnership between the state and local governments should look like regarding adult use cannabis and local licenses. Local licenses for the THC edible products legalized last year have been imperative for ensuring that these products are sold in compliance with state law. We have seen a significant amount of non-compliant products on the market, and really the way that this has been effectively managed has been through local licensing. This local involvement will be crucial in ensuring that cannabis and cannabis products are sold in compliance with the law. Licensing is not just an administrative process, it is an enforcement tool that allows local governments to respond quickly to issues that may arise from a retailer. Cities are very familiar with the role of licensing as they do this for liquor and tobacco. Local, local licenses allow communities to know exactly where these products are being sold and allows them to respond quickly in cases where retailers are acting out of compliance with the law. We also ask that this legislation authorizes local law enforcement to conduct compliance checks as they do with tobacco and liquor. Compliance checks are important to ensure that retailers are acting in accordance with the law and not selling to those under the legal age. These checks statewide will be a huge task for this new board. And to make sure that these checks actually happen, it's important to include local governments. This compliance check history also allows licensing authorities to ensure that they provide licenses to responsible retailers that do not have a record of noncompliance. Finally, it's important, uh, it is important that the bill provides at minimum the ability for local governments to limit the number of retailers in their communities and ensure local zoning authority. Minnesota will be uh, surrounded by states without legal cannabis, and many of our bordering cities, regardless uh, of the size of them or enforcement capacity, will be targeted by retailers to establish dispensaries. We want to set our communities up for success with these new products and ensure that they do have the capacity to manage them 
These are just a few of the pieces we're hoping the bill can include as it moves forward, but again, we remain committed to working with Senator Port on this as it continues to move. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hassel. Mr. Justin Miller, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Justin Miller. I am the city administrator for the city of Lakeville, and I'm the second vice president on the League of Minnesota Cities Board of Directors for this year. Lakeville recently enacted a licensing framework for THC products that mirrors how the city handles tobacco. We have had four retailers apply and receive a license. This has served as an excellent tool for the city to know exactly where these products are being sold and to ensure compliance with state law. In fact, several of these retailers welcomed the local regulation framework and encourage us to do the same if adult use cannabis is legalized. It presents a level playing field locally and helps keep out bad actors. Local licenses are extremely important tools for local law enforcement. Cities license liquor and tobacco, and these licenses allow cities to address issues with retailers immediately rather than waiting for the state. This is critical for public safety. While not all retailers are bad actors, some unfortunately do fall out of compliance with local licensing, and, local re and then that allows us to act in the best interest of the community. Cities would like to maintain this authority for cannabis and lower potency edible retailers. Cities would like to work with the state to develop uniformity and consistency in retail licensure, such as baseline requirements for retailers and retail operations. We recognize that this should be a partnership between cities and the state, but it is incredibly important for cities to maintain the license itself. We can also expect to see local public safety impacts as the enforcement of these products will fall primarily on local law enforcement. We know that this will require time and resources for local law enforcement, so we ask that this bill recognize this through partnerships and revenue sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. That brings us to the end of our scheduled testifiers. I do believe we have members of the public who would like to testify. Uh, please come forward and uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. And uh, then um, remember to sign into the sign-in sheet before you depart the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Al Flowers uh, uh, work with a collaborative called Minnesota Safe Streets. So I, uh, I, I'm here to, to say uh, I, I already know uh, the governor already told uh, the former governor, Ben Tour, he's going to sign the bill. So I'm not here to debate that part. I'm here to say as a, a person working with youth uh, and uh, on, on Minnesota Safe Street, working with young people and a person myself that has uh, a long time ago uh, got marijuana when he was a young kid, that I'm, I'm, that's, that's where uh, my concern is how, how we uh, get, it, uh, get this out and how we make sure that the situation don't get uh, worse for uh, juveniles or, or y young people, particularly in my community, which is struggling with trauma and violence in our community. So I want to get that out, uh, say that part. And then I, I want to talk about since it's been to happen, uh, uh, about uh, equity and making sure that that equity uh, hits our uh, community. This is a this could be a good start. Of, of bringing equity, if, if it's going to uh, pass, that we figure out ways that uh, the legislature and the governor figure out ways how African American uh, community, how our community can uh, be a part of uh, the retail, the distributing, the growing, uh, uh, and putting uh, resources toward there. But then I'm, uh, and I want to put that in, but I want to go back to my concern about our youth and how and, and what you got in there. Uh, uh, where we can uh, educate them, saying, hey, this is going to happen. You're not going to uh, stop them from getting it. They get, they're getting it now. So uh, uh, kids are getting uh, uh, drugs now. So you, it ain't going to be stopped like that. I think it's more education coming from different communities. And I hope this Senate, this body, uh, uh, thinks about that, because uh, you know, uh, chemical dependency is real. And so I'm, uh, that's, that's what I want to say, equity making sure we get it, uh, uh, be a part of the distribution and, uh, and seal, but keep on the top of our head our young people and what their future is going to look like uh, with this new world uh, that we're going to go into. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Okay, thank you. We have two other public testifiers at the table. Who would like to go first? 
<laughs> Please <laughs> introduce you, yourself for, for the record. Me. And thank you, Minnesota Ready, for having me today. I am Catherine Franklin. I am the founder of Sugar Canico, as well as the legacy of Gigi Strains. I wanted to start out with that I've actually been sober for 21 years. I'm a victim of unregulated and overconsumed market. It's a legal market, but it's, over, it's underregulated and very much overconsumed. So I can see all views. But I genuinely believe in this plant and what this plant can do medicinally and economically for our growth. Minnesota, if, as long as it's managed regularly and responsibly, it can help our businesses grow, no pun intended. I got into the cannabis industry over 10 years ago. I fell in love with the medicinal value of what this mother nature can do for us. Personally, it's helped me with my battle of Lyme disease, my PSD, chronic pain, from there, I got into breeding and cultivation. I wanted to understand this plant more. Leaving my socially accepted job, I dove deep into an industry that I absolutely love. Since then, I've worked in 80% of all medical and recreational states. I've worked in Washington, California, Oregon, Nevada, and lately for a year and a half in Michigan. As a cannabis advocate, a cannabis influencer, and a C-level cannabis operation consultant and compliance officer. I look forward to putting my experience and passion into this industry and working for Minnesota in my own home state, a state where I can finally speak freely and work freely on who I am and not have to go out of state and work into a legal market. Be home with my husband, who is a third generation truck driver and two beautiful children. But at right now, I can't live in my own state and work in my own state without having to feel the pain of, the, of society. I'm ecstatic to bring my personal resources, my expertise, help our economic growth, and welcome you all to speak with me more and how I can help advocate and collectively work hard to get Minnesota ready. I've seen firsthand what adult use can do for a state, as well as it's, if it's positively done together. Thank you for your testimony. And just to remind the public testifiers, please do sign in on the sign-in sheet before you leave so we have it for the record. And then to our last public testifier, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Allison Valancourt, and I am co-founder of Global Organic and Balanced Naturals. We are a women-owned cannabis company based in Northeast Minneapolis. We currently manufacture and distributor, distribute multiple hemp brands and products. I am an advisory board member of the MN is Ready Coalition, and my husband and business partner is a board member of the Hemp Growers Co-op. We started our company in 2018, right after the farm bill passed, and have been in the hemp industry in Minnesota since its inception. Over the past five years, we have seen the local industry grow, innovate, educate, and help thousands of people. Since July, this growth has increased tenfold. Our products are now being sold in grocery stores, co-ops, salons and spas, gyms, wellness shops, Cairo PT clinics, restaurants, tire shops, the list goes on. Our personal business and our retail partners' businesses have seen tremendous growth. What was once a small side business for my partners and I has now grown into an operation that employs over 30 people in a 15,000 square foot facility. Over the years, I have had the honor of hearing powerful stories and being a part of the healing journey for many people. Since July, we've had a large number of individuals speak up that have not felt safe to come forward in the past. Mothers, fathers, grandparents, educators, people like you and I. People from all walks of life looking for plant-based healing alternatives to opioids, prescription medications, and alcohol. Since July, Minnesota consumers gained access to not only a diverse assortment of products, but products from Minnesota suppliers. Legalization would allow the state to put manufacturing and testing standards into place that it would allow customers to access safe, tested products. Prohibition only limits that access. We also know that cannabis laws are disproportionately enforced, ruin lives, and waste public resources. Right now, we have the opportunity to create a diverse local craft industry that supports an equitable, safe, and innovative cannabis marketplace. Legalization is good for local businesses, it's good for the state, and it's good for the people. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we do have additional public testifiers. Please introduce yourself and proceed. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this opportunity to speak. My name is Erica Trevino. I work as a retail sales specialist at Cultivated CBD. We're a Minneapolis-based company. I perform door-to-door -door sales and provide education to retail businesses in or looking to get into the industry. The reason I got into this business, I seek racial justice for this industry. Prior to my involvement in cannabis, I worked around the country and the state of Minnesota on issues of racial equity in healthcare, education, and employment. I encountered the worst disparities, health outcomes for black, indigenous, and people of color in Minnesota. In a state where racial dialogue around issues of equity is difficult or many times absent, I saw cannabis as an opportunity to begin to address those disparities, as well as an opportunity to pave the way for those who will follow in my footsteps as a pioneer in the <clears throat> cannabis space. I've heard many people before me testify on disparities, and I think this body has accepted the data. It's time to take action and quantify that data and utilize it for the formation of a true and equitable cannabis policy. A little background on my company. I cultivated, our staff is composed of people, people, men and women from all walks of life, from our executives to people leading in the field. 99% of the company is black and people of color who are making a difference every day, following their passion with resolution and hope that we will grow and be prosperous. At Cultivated, we believe cannabis must not be used as a weapon to criminalize already vulnerable and systematically disenfranchised people. We put our values to work by addressing injustices, by creating meaningful jobs and create opportunity for people of backgrounds that have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. And in partnership with this body, we do believe that we can create a framework that is sustainable for social equity applicants. I also have the obligation to present the facts of my field work for reasons of transparency, transparency and to provide insight onto what's really going on in the market. Let me first emphasize that as a black owned People of color run company, we always follow all the regulatory and obligatory rules and laws for our industry. We are competing against companies that are manufacturing and selling up to anywhere from 250 to 1,000 milligrams at a time. And I think for the purposes of licensing that we should reward law abiding businesses with a track record of goodwill. Even more important is that licensing is prioritized for companies who are socially responsible who utilize cannabis as an economic driver to create social change and already making an impact. Let's get to work. Let's elevate the status of cannabis and this industry. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now to the gentleman on your left, if you could introduce yourself for the record. If I may, Mr. Chair, I would defer to the lady. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I need to explain something to you that I hope you will allow me uh, to complete my remarks. Sorry, Mr. Sir, if you could introduce yourself to begin your My name is William, often called Bill English. I reside at 12850th Avenue in Plymouth. I sleep there, but I work, live, and own property in both North and South Minneapolis, where I lived for more than 45 years. I came to this town 50 years ago. You should know something about my background. I came here to go to grad school and ended up staying. I was the first black salesman ever hired by 3M. And from there was a series of firsts. I ended up at a company called Control Data that many of you know. And for 32 years, I worked there putting plants in inner city areas, including North Minneapolis, St. Paul, Washington, DC, Oklahoma City, in other places. I retired in June of 2000, and I was approached by Vice President Robert Jones to join the university on a consulting basis to create jobs in North Minneapolis. We have created, as a consulting project director for the North Job Creation Team, we have created over 1,000 living wage jobs in North Minneapolis over the last. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me, I'm recovering from RSV. And that's, it, it does, that's one of the impacts. But I will, I will get through this, I promise, with just a little forbearance and patience for me. 
I said that to say to you that we, and now we're on the threshold. Last two weeks ago, the city of Minneapolis passed a $2 million long, low interest rate loan and offered the bond up to $10 million for a $20 million modular housing manufacturing facility owned and operated by Devin George, a former professional basketball player who's done some development. We are now on the, we, they're offered to do 10 million in bonds. We don't need the bonds. We've got new market credits and we're moving forward. This will create 300 jobs with all the salaries starting at $30 an hour. We created- Sir, my apologies. I regret to interrupt you. To the bill, if you could, sir. I'm sorry. Could you speak to the bill, please? Oh, okay. Um, we've, we've, have a, we've had a relationship and an agreement with the trades, so we have no conflict with the trades. So we're moving forward. I wish I could have announced that there's another project on the way in the ropes where it's in the beta testing now that is a game-changing technology that internationally is being suited by China and other 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 outside kind of company countries. This project should come on board in June, January 1st of 2024 and will hire an additional 300 people in a facility already located on the West River Road in North Minneapolis. So I'm gonna focus my remarks on what you say you do, economic development and jobs. That's what I have been doing. This industry, the cannabis industry, owes us they owe us the opportunity to participate at every level. I know so many of my friends that I grew up with in an all-black town in Illinois called Brooklyn, Illinois, go to jail for selling a $10 lid and stay for as many as 10 years. You know the penalties that they put on us. And now we have a chance. The disparities of African Americans in jail and I'm talking about ADOS. I'm not talking about black immigrants. I'm talking about ADOS, American descendants of slavery. We are the most, have the most disparity in being locked up for this crime. Now we have an opportunity for black businesses who have the experience. We got people who know, serve on national boards, have worked around the country helping understand how to, how to, how to write a decent bill and can do it, and can help do it. And they understand compliance. We don't intend to break the law. Someone said something the other day that one of our previous speakers, which made me jog my, note, uh, jog my notes to say, he talked about truck drivers being, uh, uh, using cannabis and being of safe safety. We've been selling liquor in this country uh, since prohibition. I don't know how many truck drivers has ever been stopped and taken their license for truck driving, drunk driving, but it's been a lot, because I read about them. So I don't think that th that is a reason to deny. If you can't comply, if you can't, if you can't drive and be sober, then you need to lose your license. It should be no different for cannabis than it is for liquor and alcohol. And finally, I will speak to you from my heart for just a moment. This committee is committed to economic development and jobs. African Americans has the highest, no, ADOS people, if you remember those, American descendants of slaves, slavery, has the highest level of unemployment in the nation. The New York Times told you that. The New York Times, I don't come here to beg. I just don't beg, I come here to demand that as elected representatives of the people, you do the right thing. You understand the disparities. You know we suffer economically, and you can give us a chance to participate in this business on an equitable basis, and I mean all levels. Growing, packaging and distribution, and retail. One point you need to know. We don't have a single medical dispensary in our community. Not a single one. So our people have to go outside of their communities to buy, to buy medical marijuana and, um, and pay an exorbitant price for it because you know who controls that market, the large, 
the large businesses. So we've got a lot of issues here to concern ourselves with. And I trust, I trust this committee, who is really concerned about economic development, to give us an opportunity to be partners with you and help develop a bill that we can comply with, live, and make Minnesota earn money in taxes that we can use to reinvest in marginalized communities who have been underinvested for the last 75 years. Thank you, Mr. Thank English. you so much. I appreciate your testimony. And to our final public testifier, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Farhia Khalif. I'm the director of Voice of East African Women, where we advocate for youth and families in the community. Also, I'm the director of Somali American Farmers Institute as an emerging farmer. Um, I understand the struggle that a lot of, of immigrant and minority communities go through. As you consider House file, Senate file 73, please uh, keep that in mind, just like Mr. William just stated, uh, the inclusion of the disparity. The state of Minnesota boxes each other for number one, two, three in, this, in, in the country and when it comes to disparity. So I'm just recommending for your consideration of um, economic development and inclusion when it comes to the immigrant and minority community of the state of Minnesota as you move forward this Senate file uh, 73. Somali American Farmers Institute and Voice of East African Women would like to be in support on that. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And if you could yep. clear the table, I appreciate your testimony. Yep. Looks like we have one more public testifier. If you could introduce yourself for the record and proceed. And after that, I'll have the author return to the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief. Uh, for the record, my name is Abby Breideck. I'm the director of the Minnesota Asphalt Pavement, in, uh, Minnesota Asphalt Pavement Association, and we are a, a trade organization with uh, corporate members who are road constructors, specifically with asphalt. Um, MAPA believes that employers should be protected by clear provisions allowing the right to enforce drug policies that maintain safety and productivity, as well as manage compliance with appropriate federal drug laws. Um, we, we just ask you to keep these considerations in mind when, we, uh, when, you, when you consider this bill. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Port, please return to the table. And we will go now to member questions, comments, and amendments. Chair, uh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Port. Uh, and thank the testifiers for coming up and testifying on, on your beliefs and, and thoughts on the bill. I, I do have an amendment. It's the A19 amendment, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames moves the A19. We'll distribute that to the members. And uh, you can go ahead and explain the amendment to us while it's being distributed, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the A19 amendment is an amendment that would uh, uh, allow the uh, outdoor advertisers to be able to advertise this product equal to the other advertising that we're going to allow. So on page 109 of the bill on line 21, it would in, after A, it would insert a cannabis business may erect or utilize an outdoor advertising of cannabis flower, cannabis business, and a cannabinoid product or a hemp-derived consumer product Page 109, line 23, it would delete is prohibited. And page 109, line 29, before A, insert except as provided in subdivision 2A. And this would, like I said, this would allow the ad outdoor advertisers to advertise equal to what other advertisers can advertise. And I would ask that the author look at this as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Senator Dame. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Dames. Uh, I appreciate this amendment. This is a conversation we've been having. Uh, we've been working on getting to a solution for it. I, I would accept this as a friendly amendment. Thank you, ma'am. Any other member comments on the A19? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? A19 is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Port. Uh, before we proceed with any further amendments, I was hopeful that we could get out of the way any questions about the bill that members have. Uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I have quite a few questions, so maybe amendments would be 
I appreciate the opportunity to ask them, but. Okay, will do. Please give me a moment. So I apologize. Uh, I'm a little off my A game here because the version of the bill I worked off of uh, had the pages and lines changed uh, as of today when the bill got through uh, judiciary. So I'm going to try to direct people to where I'm asking questions from just to help us out here. So, um, Senator and, Duckworth, I have the old bill in front of me too. So Okay, maybe we can, <laughs> that might make my life a lot easier. Um, and I just want to reiterate the fact that, uh, Senator Port, you mentioned earlier, uh, your hope is that we're not here to debate the merits of legalizing marijuana or not. Um, I agree. We'll have that discussion later, maybe even in other committees. Uh, so please know that a lot of these questions are uh, just to shake out and give consideration to a very significant piece of legislation that we're considering on behalf of the state of Minnesota. So that's where these questions are coming from. And really, they serve the purpose to maybe hopefully improve it or in good faith make some tweaks that might uh, um, or at least cause us to think about some changes we might make. So first and foremost, on uh, page two, which is article one, there are a couple of instances that say, uh, for example, under adult use cannabinoid product, it talks about a cannabinoid product that is approved for sale by the office or is substantially similar to a product approved by the office. And that's in a few different spots. So I'm just wondering, uh, what does that mean? Could you give me an example? I'm, I'm just a little bit worried from an oversight standpoint, are we saying that products that are somewhat kind of sort of similar to products that the office has approved will be allowed for sale? Or what is the purpose of that language? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Klein and Senator Duckworth. The intent of that is to be if you do, if you're making an edible and you make a different flavor of the same edible, something like that, a, slight change, but essentially the same product, that you wouldn't have to go all the way back through the regulatory process. I would be happy to work with you to sort of define that out a little bit more so that it, uh, it's more clear. It is not meant to be a new company who makes something similar to, or a new producer who makes something similar to something that has already been approved, wouldn't have to go through the process. It's just a slight change to an existing product that has gotten approval. Senator Duckworth. Very good. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may ask a few more. Senator Duckworth. Uh, on page uh, 13 of the original uh, bill, the copy said you have in front of you, it talks about the Office of Cannabis Management, and it outlines what the office must do. Uh, number one, it says promote the public health and welfare. Uh, how do you envision the office doing that as it relates to uh, cannabis products and their consumption? Senator Port. Thank you, Senator uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, I'll, I'll defer a little bit to the expert I have with me who's uh, worked on this, but um, to say we put that first for a reason um, because through the legalizing of this product, we want to ensure that the medical, uh, the health of Minnesotans continues to be our first priority. Um, I will defer to Laylee on the specifics of what that entails, but that there's a reason it is number one. Ms. Fatehi, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Laylee Fatehi. I'm the campaign manager for MN is Ready. We are the state's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders. And we have been working for several years and especially in the last several months as we will be continuing to do so for the next several months going forward on uh, ensuring that this bill is in the best shape possible to um, ensure safety, equity, and a Minnesota first approach to the cannabis industry. Um, we see this bill fundamentally as being a public health bill. Prohibition of cannabis creates a public health risk uh, to Minnesotans that um, you know, an unregulated illicit market that sells products that don't go through any approval process to children, um, you know, that is a public health problem. And so the top priority of this Office of Cannabis Management is to eliminate an illicit market and to replace it with a well-regulated legal market that has in it provisions like childproof packaging. 
accurate labeling and testing of products, accurate dosage information, advertising rules so that you are not marketing these products to children, making sure that there is an adequate supply of the product to meet adult use demand so that we don't have pockets of the illicit market or so that people who are in the medical cannabis program don't have access to the products they need. And I would say that even the social, you know, the, the expungement provisions, the social equity provisions, these are all public health provisions as well. As we know that the prohibition of cannabis has created systemic impacts that have public health impacts uh, for communities of color. Members, before we proceed, I just want to give an update on time for um, the interest of all members. So we had initially planned to close the hearing and take a vote at 200, uh, sorry, 2.45 p.m. Clearly, uh, we have a number of amendments yet to come, and we plan to honor that. We've been told we have the room for as much time as we need today. Uh, so we will proceed. If the, having said that, if there are members who have uh, prior obligations and need to leave and want to make comments or offer amendments, uh, now, now would be the time to do that. So. Senator Howe. Thank you. And I, I don't want to disrupt the role that uh, Senator Duckworth on, on, but I, I do have a question that I would like to ask, and, and I do have other prior commitments. Uh, on, on, and this is the, the new, uh, the bill, but it, and in a number of places, it requires local governments to to identify code requirements before the licensing is approved. So my question is, is many of the, many of the places in, in the, here in the metropolitan area are going to have those capabilities and they're going to have those of city officials to go out, building code officials, fire code officials to go out and look at the, the conditions of the building. Uh, Outstate that doesn't exist. So, what are the parameters for outstate in these cities are less than 2,500 that may have these facilities? Who's gonna Who's gonna do that within 30 days, or, or what structure do you have in place to to address that? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Howe. Um, I'm interested in this question, though. A little bit that's true for any business that opens. They have to meet building codes, requirements, and the cities have to sign off on those sorts of codes and requirements for any business to open. I mean, they have to meet building code requirements regardless of what kind of business they are. Senator Hall. Thank you, Chair Klein. And in cities of under 2,500, you really, a contractor is supposed to build to the building code. Uh, I will guarantee you in cities under 2,500, no one is looking. There's no building permits required. There is nothing out there for these folks. So that's, you know, there's got to be a place much like, much like they do with daycares, that type of thing. You need to put something in here to address that situation because currently, you won't see a building code official or fire code official out there in cities less than 2,500. Senator Port? Ms. Fatay? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe. I think you raise an interesting point. So what the bill does have in its licensing provisions, and I think a couple of other provisions are requirements for when a business is applying to get its license that it has to provide um, as part of that application process, certain plans, like, you know, they have to provide their security plan and things like that. You raising this issue is an interesting one. Um, I think it's something that as we are looking at ways to improve the bill, considering those kinds of, um, you know, physical infrastructure type things and that, you know, may need some oversight in the approval process is certainly something that um, we can look into. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Howe. Uh, Senator Howe, if we could sit down and talk about that, I would love to figure out who is the right entity to help us with that. Is it counties? Is it someone at the state? How do we help provide those resources to make sure that the questions get answered? I, I would be interested in sitting down and working with you on that. Senator Howe. That's fine. No, that, that'll work. We'll, in the future, we'll have that discussion. Thank you. Senator Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Senator Port, for bringing this forward. And uh, Senator Howe, to your question, 
Members, for some of the IIJA money that we're hoping to provide matching funds for, for some of the IRA money, the Commerce Department is providing technical assistance with a special eye towards smaller communities. So just throwing that out there as you work to improve the bill that we already faced this year because of some of the federal money coming in, some need to look out for smaller communities. And just in the example of IIJA and IRA, the uh, proposal for the Commerce Competitiveness Fund has, I think, in the governor's budget, just as an example, uh, $13 million for technical assistance. And my guess is Senator Howe has an excellent point that the smaller the community, the more likely that will be helpful to get these businesses and the IIJA and IRA money going. Just throwing that out there, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank Senator you. Friends. Um, thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, so with that, we can proceed either to amendments or to further questions under Senator Duckworth as you, Senator, jo Senator uh, Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do appreciate um, you and this committee taking time to fully uh, go through the amendments today. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would move the A24 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A24. Senator Rasmussen, please describe the amendment as it's being distributed to the members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the In the bill, uh, a division of social equity is created that operates under the Office of Cannabis Management. And this division is tasked with looking at the impacts of prohibition and mitigate against them. Um, the division of social equity, in my view, should also look at impacts of usage of cannabis. We know that consumption of cannabis can have negative health impacts. And so would like to include that as a mandate for this office. Um, the A24 amendment simply adds the words <laughs> and usage into the work that the Division of Social Equity will be doing. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Klein, uh, Senator Rasmussen. We discussed this earlier. Um, I consider this a friendly amendment. Members have any comments on the A24? I'll wait till it's distributed to all members. We'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the A24 say aye. Aye. Oppose? The amendment is adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A9 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A9. While that's being distributed, please describe the amendment. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, um, this amendment does the same thing uh, and just adds end usage in another portion of the bill that refers to the division of social equity. Well, Senator Port. I, I support this amendment, consider it a friendly amendment. We'll wait for it to be distributed to all members and then we'll proceed to comments or a vote. Comments on the A9? All those in favor of the A9 say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. The A9 is adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A14 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A14 amendment. Please describe the amendment. The current bill defines the operating hours for cannabis retailers. Um, however, the hours in the bill do not match up with Minnesota law in regards to the operation, operational hours for liquor stores. So the A14 amendment simply matches the hours in the bill for cannabis retailers to that of liquor stores here in Minnesota. I think it's important, especially for consistency, whether it's for law enforcement or uh, local units of government, that they um, don't have a confusing framework with different hours for cannabis retailers versus liquor retailers. Senator Port. Uh, thank you, Senator Klein and Senator Rasmussen. Uh, we talked about this earlier today, and I've had a few more discussions. This is going to be an ongoing conversation, um, but I tend to agree with you. Uh, I think it makes it easier for regulation uh, and for law enforcement. So I, I will accept this amendment as friendly. We'll wait for the amendment to be distributed to all members. Any discussion on the A14? All those in favor of the A14, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. The A14 is adopted. Senator Rasmussen. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A23 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A23. Please describe the amendment, Senator Rasmussen. In the bill, there are labeling requirements, um, but I, I do think they need to be tightened and uh, better match the labeling laws that we have for tobacco products here in the state of Minnesota. The current language is permissive on some consumer information, in addition to not having a requirement to label products, uh, in particular to signal the health impact it could have on a baby's health uh, um, if uh, you are pregnant. The CDC has listed numerous negative impacts on a baby's health if cannabis is consumed while pregnant. The A23 amendment changes a may to a must on the consumer information that needs to be available. It includes information uh, requirement on substance abuse and then would require that all cannabis products have a label that says simply cannabis can harm your health and your baby's health if you are pregnant. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Rasmussen. Um, my comments on this one are that uh, this is an ongoing conversation, both with uh, the industry, but also we, uh, in this bill, lay out a number of studies that have to be done over the next several years. And we want to make sure that the bill is inclusive of adding additional things as MDH or the industry finds results. Um, so I, I am willing to take this as an amendment today with the caveat that this is a work in progress and there will probably be tweaks to it before the end, uh, but that this is protecting public health is a big part of our goal. And so we are working towards this and uh, I will accept it today with the caveat that it may get tweaked in the future. And as we know, this bill will stop at uh, HHS committee at some point, at which it, point this could be fine-tuned, and yes, I believe will. you serve on that committee. Any comments on the A23? Mr. Chair, just briefly, if I may. Senator Duckworth. Thank you. Uh, I'm encouraged to hear that. I hope you do. We're, there's a, quite a few amendments that are, are coming through, and that's great, but this one in particular, it caught my attention too. We found out this morning that we both had flagged it. Um, some sort of a, a warning required, whether it's on packaging, a pamphlet, a piece of paper for folks that are going to get and consume these products. Uh, we are commerce and consumer protection after all. Uh, I would really, really like to see that in there. I think it would, it would do some good. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. All those in favor of the A23 say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. The A23 is adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A11 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A11. Please describe the amendment. Uh, subrogation is a longstanding insurance tool to recoup costs from negligent or at-fault parties whose actions cause a loss. Uh, the current bill uh, has a prohibition on subrogation without a insurance requirement that we see in similar dram shop um, uh, statutes regarding alcohol. Um, and that prohibition as it currently stands would only protect negligent cannabis shops. So the amendment uh, simply removes the subrogation prohibition, allowing accountability for negligent, negligent cannabis shops in Minnesota. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and uh, Senator Rasmussen. We may have a testifier who could give us a little bit of ex No, never mind. He doesn't uh, have the expertise on this. Um, this is a conversation that we're having. I have a meeting next week with some of the insurance folks talking about this. Um, at this time, I would ask members to vote no with the caveat that we will stay in conversation about this uh, and make sure we get the language right. I think the goal of everyone is to make sure that we have the proper insurance coverage and that liability is going to the correct people. Um, and, uh, but want to, want to make sure we get that language right. And I will just say at this moment, I don't know the answer. So I'm going to say, ask you to please vote no for the moment. And Senator Port, uh, Mr. Cocking from the insurance industry is here and I'd like him to come forward and offer some insight onto this amendment. 
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, again, Aaron Cocking, Insurance Federation of Minnesota, as I laid out in my earlier testimony, uh, is something we, we definitely want to see dealt with. Uh, it came to our attention late. I had texted Senator Report this morning, uh, certainly willing to work on it. Uh, our feeling is, is if we want to keep the subrogation language in there, we need to do something similar to dram shop insurance where we make sure that there is uh, some sort of protection there. If we're not going to do something like that, the subrogation restrictions should be taken out altogether. So we're happy to continue working, whether the, this seems like the proper venue, uh, proper committee to deal with it, but we can yes. we can continue working down the process. We know this is a work in progress. Thank you, Mr. Cocking. Mr. Ras uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Oh, so, excuse me, Senator Rasmussen. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is This is in the, the Commerce purview, right? This this discussion, I mean, this this amendment's under the purview of the Commerce, correct? Uh, Mr. Hudal. I would say there is a slight ambiguity as to that question. To the extent it does touch on insurance subrogation, uh, that would be within uh, the purview of Commerce. That being said, um, I'm not too familiar, but you keep hearing the term dram shop um, come up. And that is a civil liability act that is clearly within the purview of our judiciary committee. So given that this is going back, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chair, with the dram shop, uh, alcohol is under the purview of the Commerce Committee. And so wouldn't that bring the dram shop stuff with it? Okay. Well, my concern, uh, Mr. Chair, my concern is, is that what I don't want to have happen is that this starts going through to the other committees and it's not in their purview, so it's ruled that they can't deal with it and, and it ends up getting missed or doesn't get dealt with. So if there's a pretty good, uh, if it's pretty sure that this can be dealt with in another committee, I understand. Otherwise, I get a little concerned not acting on it today and then finding out that nothing's gonna happen because this is where the purview is. Mr. Chair. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, after a conversation, we have been going back and forth on whether to require the sort of dram shop type insurance or whether to remove the subjuga subjugation. In order to make sure we deal with it today and that it's dealt with one way or another, I will accept this amendment. Thank you, Senator Port. Thank Senator you. Rasmussen, further discussion. All those in favor of the A11, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The A11 is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, appreciate the bill author and the conversation on this amendment and, and appreciate her willingness to continue working on these important issues. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would move the A-12 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A-12 amendment. Please describe the amendment. Under Minnesota law, uh, it details very specifically what Minnesota liquor stores can retail. It has a very limited uh, numerated list in terms of the products. As some members may remember with uh, last session's liquor bill, there was a long conversation on whether to not add citrus fruit uh, to that list um, that liquor stores could uh, retail. The current bill allows liquor stores to sell cannabis edibles. Um, and so that would allow a liquor store uh, to sell pot brownies, but not normal brownies. The A12 amendment simply removes the addition of edibles to the list that liquor stores are able to sell. Um, this, if this is something that uh, wanted to be added to the list later on, it could be addressed in a future liquor bill, um, but I think it's wise to pull this out of the current bill um, that deals with liquor statutes. Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Klein, Senator Rasmussen. Uh, this is, I will ask members to vote no on this amendment. One of the strongest parts of our bill is that we want these, these products to be sold in age-restricted stores. Liquor stores are already age-restricted. They already know how to do this. Uh, they are our first line to get these products out there legally to our um, communities, and uh, I ask you to oppose this amendment. Member discussion. Senator Rasmussen, final comments on the amendment. All those in favor of the A12 say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. The amendment is not adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A8 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A8. Please describe the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, most places in this bill 
require an individual to be 21 years of age or older to uh, possess cannabis. However, there is a loophole for registered caregivers in the language that sets the age at 18 years and older. The A8 amendment simply uh, has a uniform age requirement at 21 for all individuals. And uh, Mr. Chair, I believe this will help law enforcement and Minnesotans avoid a confusing framework that has different age requirements for handling cannabis depending on the intended use. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Klein and Senator Rasmussen. Um, I ask members to oppose this amendment. Uh, the medical program has uh, been built with much input from community, and there are many members uh, in that program who have 18-year-old children who help them as caregivers and things like that, 19, 20-year-old um, children who are able to help them uh, pick up their meds, uh, consume their meds, things like that. It is also, in my understanding, this is something we will discuss in more depth in uh, the HHS committee as we get into the, the medical program more specifically. Uh, but I ask members to vote no. Member comments on the A8. Final comments on the amendment, Senator Rasmussen. All those in favor of the A8 say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. Nay, amendment is not adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A21 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A21. Please describe the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, lower uh, potency edible product retail, the retailer license, could turn every bar, restaurant, gas station into a cannabis retailer. This would dramatically expand the locations for law enforcement to monitor, and in addition would expose new people to cannabis products who are perhaps not looking for cannabis products. The A21 amendment simply delays the implementation of the lower potency edible product retailer licensing for four years. This would give us a chance to see how legalization is going before dramatically expanding the retail exposure of cannabis to Minnesotans. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein. Uh, I'm gonna ask members to please vote no on this and defer to my licensing expert on uh, the explanation of why. Ms. Fatih. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senators. The, um, the provisions that passed last session to uh, regulate these hemp-derived lower potency uh, edible products, they were put in place because, by and large, these products are federally compliant uh, with the federal farm bill, and so they were already on the market, you could buy them online, you can get them over state line, you were finding them in stores all over the place with no restrictions on um, uh, dosage, packaging, labeling, age restrictions, and so uh, those provisions of the law that passed last session um, put in place some regulatory structure around that to ensure that in Minnesota, um, there was control of, of how these products are being sold. What this bill has in place is a temporary provision that tightens up the regulation of those products. It includes you know, registration with the Department of Health so that we know where it is that these products are being sold. Um, those provisions would sunset once the full uh, licensing framework takes place. I'll point out that these are significantly lower potency products, five milligrams per product. Um, we have seen them now being sold in Minnesota and seen uh, pretty responsible stewardship from those that are um, selling them. Uh, so, you know, and the exposure to cannabis products is prevalent and widespread, especially since, again, these products are federally legal. And so if we're not selling them in a regulated fashion here in Minnesota, they'll be sold in an unregulated fashion here in Minnesota. Member comments on the A21. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate that um, conversation. It's, it's my understanding that uh, you know, this new license structure would be in place permanently in the current law, um, Mr. Chair, and that there isn't a sunset for it. But I guess, uh, Mr. Chair, there'd be a question for the testifier just to make sure I'm reading the bill correctly. Ms. Fatay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Rasmussen, the, it's Article, I believe, 7 of. Here, I have the. Or Article 8 is the temporary regulation provision of the bill. That is the set of temporary provisions that would govern the lower potency hemp-derived 
uh, cannabis edible market um, from enactment to when the Office of Cannabis Management is set up and its permanent regulations and um, uh, are, are put in place. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want mem for members of awareness and at least my reading the bill, the lower potency edible product retail license uh, would be a permanent feature of this bill and it has lower regulatory requirements and restrictions than the other cannabis licensing uh, provisions included in here. So I would ask for member support of the amendment. I, I think this is just delaying when this lower uh, regulatory um, license would come online and give us some time to figure out if we want potentially every bar, restaurant, gas station in Minnesota to be retailing cannabis. But I appreciate the conversation today. Seeing no further comments, uh, all those in favor of the A21, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Nay. Amendment is not adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A20 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A20 amendment. Please describe the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the bill has a framework for determining who is awarded licenses from the Office of Cannabis, Cannabis Management. One of the criteria is concerning. If someone were to commit a uh, drug crime between now and January 1st, when this law goes into place, they would actually get preference in obtaining a license to sell cannabis. Um, Mr. Chair, members, this creates an incentive to break the law, especially with the expungement provisions in this bill. Um, and so the A20 amendment maintains, it maintains and does not change the social equity applicant section of the bill, uh, but it does remove bonus points for breaking the law. Um, I think this is a common sense change uh, to this bill and would ask for member support. Senator Port. Just one moment, Mr. Chair. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Rasmussen. Um, as this sits, I'm not ready to adopt it um, because I think it takes out a whole paragraph that I'm concerned about. Uh, but I am willing to continue this conversation and the licensing conversation will continue. Um, in particular, that piece, we are still uh, working on potentially the decriminalization date being immediately upon enactment. And so it, with automatic expungement starting, so it could, um, you know, change the timelines of all of those. I see what you're saying and like willing to definitely work with you to make sure we figure that piece out because I, I agree with the sentiment. I just don't want to undo the work of the social equity group uh, that has, that they have done to ensure that we are focusing on the community that has been most impacted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that conversation. And I, I hope that this does get uh, updated and changed as we go forward. Um, so I will withdraw the A20 amendment. Um, Senator Rasmussen withdraws the A20 amendment, and I would just make my own comment on it that I think your point is fairly apt about the perverse incentive created quite unintentionally um, uh, towards criminality in the interim. So hopefully you guys can work it out. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A16 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A16 amendment. Can you please describe the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The current bill does not give local units of government the ability to determine whether or not they want cannabis retailers in their area. As we've heard from both the county, the counties and the cities uh, in our, their testimony today, they would prefer to have more local control. Otter Tail County, uh, where I represent, doesn't have to have the same approach as Hennepin County. And so the A16 amendment uh, simply allows local units of government the option of whether or not they want 
to have cannabis retailers operating in their jurisdiction. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Rasmussen. Uh, I ask members to oppose this amendment. This is a really critical piece of the whole of this bill. Uh, what we've learned from other states uh, in, in the fact that we are 10 years behind a lot of other states is we've been able to learn from their mistakes. Um, and what we've seen in other states is allowing for local units of government to prohibit the licensing or um, supply or, or existing existence of cannabis retailers in their areas opens up a hole for the illicit market. Um, a big part of how we have built this bill is what the mo absolute most we can do <laughs> to end the illicit market in Minnesota. It's why the tax rate is low, um, much lower than it has been in other states, because we know if the price is too high, there will still be a black market. It's why we prohibit uh, the banning of cannabis retailers in certain areas because of, if there are gaps in where you can purchase, it will create a need for the illicit market. So uh, respectfully, I, un I understand and we are willing to work with the city and counties on many of their um, concerns, but this is not one we are willing to budge on because this will keep the black market alive. And if our real goal is to move away from illegal, untested, unsafe drugs that are sold to people who do not need to provide an ID, who do not need to be 21 years of age or older, this will only help keep that alive. Senator Rasmus. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would be remiss and I would probably get in a lot of trouble if I didn't speak up on this amendment, given the, the city administrator from Lakeville was here to, to speak about just that, and that is the city I live in and represent. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Senator Port. Um, I'm hopeful that if this amendment isn't adopted today, we do find ways in which we're offering cities, townships, counties, the ability to weigh in on this, have some sort of local control at their level. It's absolutely critical. Some of the questions we're gonna ask later uh, point out that there seems to be a conflict between uh, local governments being able to say yes or no to certain aspects of cannabis legalization, but here we're not allowing them to. I know that they're they're able to give license or the, their municipalities are able to be a licensed uh, distributor, I believe. Um, but figuring out a way that we are accommodating their concerns, I think is absolutely critical. Um, and I'll save, I guess, some more comments and questions about an illicit market for later. Um, but uh, I would really hope us, really hope that if we don't adopt this now, that we do find a way to work with them in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Roll call requested and will be performed. Other member comments? <laughs> Clerk will take the roll. Chair Klein. No. Senator Seberger. No. Senator Dames. Yes. Senator Duckworth. Yes. Senator Frentz? No. Senator Wicklin? No. Senator Howe? Absent. Senator Latz? Absent. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Rasmussen? Yes. There being three I and five nay, votes. The amendment is not adopted on the A-16. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Maybe pleased to know this is my last amendment for the day. I would move the A-17 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A-17. Please describe the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the bill before us requires any applicant for a license to have a labor peace agreement signed by a labor union before they can be issued a license under this bill. Uh, no other place in Minnesota law do we have that requirement for any licensee or other business. The A-17 amendment removes this requirement, uh, but it does nothing to discourage union organizing in the cannabis industry. And so I would ask for members to, um, to support the A-17 amendment to make sure that uh, we're not putting a new requirement that exists nowhere else in Minnesota law in this bill.
Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Rasmussen. Uh, I ask members to vote no on this. This is a key provision to ensure that there's no disruption in the supply uh, and distribution market. Um, and we, when you have disruptions like that, it is, again, another key option for, or opportunity for the black market. So I ask members to vote no. Further member discussion? Request roll call. Roll call requested. Senator Duckworth. Uh, I support this amendment, and it caught my attention, too. The good news is this is going to eliminate one of my questions uh, coming up here. I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about potential future implications something like this in state statute might have for other industries. Um, the fact that it doesn't exist now, at least I'm taking Senator Rasmussen at his word because that was my question. Where, where else do we have this requirement? If it doesn't exist anywhere else, and we put it into existence, maybe we do, I see a grab of the microphone. If we put it into existence here, uh, what precedent are we setting for other industries and other licensing requirements for small business owners like myself and those I represent? Ms. Fatehi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Duckworth. The labor uh, peace agreements in industries where if there is a disruption to the workforce, it impacts the operation in a way that ends up having a detrimental societal impact, such as a public health impact, um, you know, those are where you have a compelling reason to have something like a labor peace agreement, and that's what um, motivates this provision. So that would be kind of, you'd have to have a justification based on, on public health or safety. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that context. You know, the, the cannabis industry here, and at least the bill that we're talking about, this is recreational marijuana. We're, we're legalizing recreational marijuana in this bill, and this, this isn't the defense industry. This isn't airlines. Um, and so I, I don't know why we are taking out this recreational product in this industry and putting on such an unusual requirement in Minnesota statute. And so I'd ask for members' support of the um, A-17 amendment. On the A 17th, Senator Dames requests a roll call, and a roll call is granted. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Klein? Nay. Senator Seberger? No. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Duckworth? Yes. Senator Frentz? No. Senator Wicklin? No. Senator Howe? Absent. Senator Latz? Absent. Senator Zhang? Senator Rasmussen. Yes. On the A-17, the ayes have three votes, five votes in the nay. The amendment is not adopted. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, since we're on the roll of amendments, uh, I'll offer mine. I only have one but I promise what I lack in amendments I'll make up for in questions. I offer the A-22, please. Senator Duckworth offers the A-22 amendment. Senator Duckworth, please describe the amendment while it's distributed to the members. Uh, will do, and thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do have the amendment is reflective of the updated bill version, so I'll reference the updated page numbers and lines. Uh, if you flip to page 109, you can see as it regards to, uh, as it relates to advertisements, there's certain language in here that talks about limitations that would be applicable to all advertisements. Things such as an, an advertisement uh, would not be able to contain false or misleading statements, contain unverified claims, promote the overconsumption of cannabis, uh, cannot depict a person under 21 years of age consuming cannabis, uh, cannot include an image designed or likely to appeal to those under age 21. What this amendment would do or seek to do is add a sixth um, item here, and the language would read as this. So adverti an advertisement that does not contain a warning as specified by the office regarding impairment and health risks, including driving while impaired, side effects, adverse reactions, and pregnancy complications. Uh, it would also seek to add this language to uh, page 111, and it would be the uh, sixth what the sixth item listed there as well so really in layman's terms what this gets to is if we're going to have advertisements re regarding the consumption or use of cannabis that we'd at least like those advertisements to contain uh, some sort of a warning of this nature 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Duckworth. I consider this to be a friendly amendment. For discussion, Senator Duckworth. On the A22, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The A22 is adopted. Are there any further amendments from the committee? Are there member questions or comments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, uh, I appreciate the work we've done so far. Uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to continue to make improvements here and there. I appreciate the author's willingness to adopt some of those amendments. Um, and hopefully, at the end of the day, we'll have the best product possible. So if I could pick up where I left off with some questions, and again, I apologize. I'm going to revert to the, some of the original page numbers. If you ever need me to, to try to change, just let me know. Uh, but we were under the Office of Cannabis Management and the things that that office must do. Uh, one of them listed is protect public safety. Now, we're not judiciary, so I'm not going to go down a tangent on public safety, but my question is this from a, a consumer protection standpoint, which does relate to our committee. Uh, a lot of conversation has taken place about the ability of law enforcement to be able to test how under the influence somebody may be of cannabis, marijuana, THC, what have you. Um, it's a very important concern that I have, and I know others have. So I'm wondering, can you give us an update on, on where things stand? Do, do law enforcement currently have the ability, if they were to pull someone over who's under the influence of marijuana, can they test them and determine just how under the influence they are? Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, I want to point out a few things. Um, first, it is not how much of a an impairing object you consume or, or substance that you consume. It is how impaired you are that makes driving impaired a problem. Um, with alcohol, uh, it's sort of the outlier in this area because we have study after study after study that was able to tie very closely uh, the your blood alcohol level with your level of impairment. Um, so we have that specific test that is able to, to test your level of impairment because it correlates to your blood alcohol level. That is not true with lots of other substances. You can take Benadryl and be impaired. You can take prescription drugs that are fully legal and be impaired. Um, you can consume cannabis and be impaired along with a whole host of other controlled substances. Um, what uh, law enforcement does have is tests for impairment. They are able to do field sobriety tests as they have for decades um, to test the level of impairment. And at this point, that is still the most effective test uh, to test a driver's impairment level. We are working with the DWI task force and uh, there are studies and money set aside in this to continue to test if there is an oral um, test that we can do. Uh, and, and we will continue to work on that and this sets money aside for it, but um, we have a way to test for impairment and our law enforcement already uses it for a whole host of things aside from alcohol. Thank you, Senator Porton. I, I think I agree that the line of questioning does extend beyond the purview of this committee or the expertise of this committee, but uh, go ahead, Senator Duckworth. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the latitude. I'm not going to ask any follow-ups as it relates to that. I'll, I'll be hopeful that it's covered in the judiciary, so I appreciate it. Um, if I may, Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth. I I am curious to know uh, or hear how we believe that this legalization will uh, completely eliminate the illicit market for this drug. Um, do we expect that to happen over a period of time? Are we acknowledging that it is probably still going to exist, but maybe in a different capacity? And here's why I ask. There are certain drugs that are legal uh, that you can't obtain legally that we know have created an illicit or an illegal market. So simply by legalizing marijuana or cannabis, how are we uh, coming to the conclusion that we're going to completely wipe out that illicit market? And I ask that because the, the office is tasked with doing that. Senator Port. Uh, thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, 
you're right. Like there is a black market for nearly everything. Uh, you can get a black market iPhone, but most people don't buy black market iPhones. The vast, vast majority of people who buy an iPhone buy them through the legal market. Um, but a black market still exists. We are never going to completely stamp out every black market opportunity for this. Our hope is to do as much of that as possible and to move people from an untested, unregulated product to a product that has safety standards um, and is age tested, uh, that we have a means to control who gets it. And a big part of the way we're going to do that is in how this bill was written, and that is by making sure that it is not too expensive uh, and that it is high quality. Um, we have a medical cannabis program here in Minnesota that is very high quality, and it is very expensive. And when we added flower cannabis to that program, it dropped the cost down significantly. It still stayed high quality, but it allowed people to stay in that program, to join that program who couldn't have been before, who were buying on the illicit market before because cannabis was the only option they had for pain relief. And so we know that when we can bring the cost down, we know that when we can offer it in a legal market, the majority of the consumers who want to buy this product want to participate in the legal market. We're never gonna be able to completely stamp out an, an illegal market, certainly until the rest of the country legalizes because there are states surrounding us that don't have legal markets and that's going to spill over our borders, for sure. Um, but the, the things that we are putting in this bill really are focused on doing the most that we can to make sure we have a high quality product that is regulated, tested, and sold to a regulated market uh, that is age tested in to do our best uh, work that we can to, to stamp out that illicit market and to keep it low cost. Ms. Patay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just add one additional point that's just narrow specific to your question of what would this office be able to do in order to um, help eliminate the black market. Um, one of the things that we've taken great care in, in the consideration and how the bill is drafted but is something we are continuing to refine and have conversations about is ensuring that there is adequate legal supply to meet what the market demand is. And you'll notice that in a number of the provisions, you know, so it is a big priority in this bill to ensure that we are promoting a local small business, Minnesota first approach. That said, the higher priority is that public safety and public health, and that requires the assurance that we are able to have adequate supply to meet demand. So you'll see there are provisions in there that say, unless, it is necessary to ensure we have adequate supply to meet demand. So the um, office is granted uh, that authority to be able to um, make you know, decisions on that basis when necessary. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I appreciate the, the transparent response. Obviously, it's, it's not a market that's the illicit market anyway. It's not going to go away. And I think it's important that uh, that's a part of, if we're going to legalize this, people need to know that's still going to be a risk and it's still going to be a danger that they need to be aware of. I would hate for there to be some sort of false misconception or presumption that now because it's legal, uh, it, it, anything that you would find anywhere is just fine. Uh, and here's the deal. Uh, the same can be said of alcohol, right? You have to be 21 to per or older to purchase and legally consume, but we know there are plenty of underage kids that might consume alcohol might consume too much of it, and it's harmful and detrimental to them. Uh, so that gets me to my next question, which has to do, and I think you just alluded to this, meet the market demand for cannabis and cannabis product. How does the office itself, what, what does that mean? How does it meet the demand for this product throughout the state? Senator Port. Ms. Fatehi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Duckworth. The provisions in the bill call for the um, office to conduct 
uh, study and to report to the legislature on essentially what the market demand is. And that is something that is done on the front end um, and something that is then annually also reported on. And so, you know, we anticipate that demand may fluctuate, but it is built into, um, it's baked into, into the statute. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Duckworth. I, I don't know if you have a follow-up on this question, but I, I'm wondering if at the end of this question, if we could just take a five-minute recess. My legs freeze up if I have to sit for too long and would just like an opportunity to walk around for a minute. Senator Duckworth. I don't have any follow-up. I would also like a break. Thank you. <laughs> we are in a five-minute recess. Thank you.
committee will come to order. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, my next question has to do with um, the statewide monitoring system that's included in this bill on page 21 of the old version, I think 22 of the new version. And it says the office must contract with an outside, an outside vendor to establish a statewide monitoring system. So I guess my, my question is, is twofold. Um, if, the, if we're creating an entire office to monitor and regulate cannabis, uh, why is it that they're contracting with a third party? And then what does that, what, what does that state, statewide monitoring system kind of look like, or what's it trying to get at? Thank you. Ms. Patey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. Um, it's contracted with a third party because this is a very robust kind of seed to shelf type of tracking. Um, there are uh, software platforms or monitoring platforms for this. Um, the medical program has contracted with Metric, which is one that's used elsewhere. Um, I think the idea is that we want to be able to quickly start putting a dent in that uh, illicit market and get a legal, well-regulated market up and running, and it would take um, considerable time for a unit of government to go through the processes that are necessary to create and implement its own tracking system. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, I think this committee can probably agree that the government hasn't ever been particularly good at creating this kind of software. Um, and there is already software out there that does this um, much cheaper than we could build it in-house as well. So it's a, it's a fiscal concern as well. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in terms of monitoring, are we simply just talking about the entering of data? Or are we talking about visibly watching and uh, seeing a product at various locations, looking at its movement? I guess that's my question. The word monitoring to me doesn't necessarily just mean the inputting of data. So if that's what we're getting at, then that might help shed some light on my question. Ms. Fatay. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. That provision, I believe, has to do specifically with that like tracking of the products through through using the software system. Um, in terms of what I think you are asking about, I mean, the uh, bill grants the Office of Cannabis Management the authority to inspect any licensed business at any point in time. Um, so that would be the kind of you know monitoring that you would have, and it also has like a complaint driven process for that as well, where it would be then an expedited um, inspection. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, similarly, it talks about data submission requirements um, and what the, I guess, the licensees must do and how they must submit data. I'm just curious, how often are they expected to be uh, entering their data? At subdivision two under the statewide monitoring system, I'll read it aloud for you. The monitoring system must allow cannabis businesses to submit monitoring data to the office through the use of monitoring system software commonly used within the industry and may also permit cannabis businesses to submit monitoring data through manual data entry with approval from the office. Um, how often, how frequent, what's the expectation here? And um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm hoping to gain some understanding of. Ms. Fatigue. Uh Mr. Chair, Senator, I'd be happy to get to look through the bill more closely and make sure that this answer I'm about to give is correct. My, I would imagine that this would be something that would be determined through the rulemaking process that the office would be setting those kinds of standards, but it may be written explicitly somewhere in there in terms of you know when you're getting your license renewed or something. So I'd be happy to double check uh, which of those two things is right and get back to you. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, we, we will check on that. And if it is not written explicitly, I'd be happy to work with you to, to write a specific period of time. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. So bear with me as I find my next page for the next question. So on uh, page 28, it talks about license types. Uh, has a, a bunch listed. I'm just curious, uh, has the cost already been determined per license 
Um, and where does that revenue go? Ms. Fatay. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. There is a $250 application fee. There is not a there is not a cost to have the license. There is that application fee, but not the license fee because we want to ensure um, that small startups here in Minnesota can get into this and that it is not cost prohibitive and uh, sort of lends itself towards only sort of the big guys from out of state. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, like many licenses that the Commerce Department um, oversees or administers, tracks, what have you, uh, fairly often they're required to be renewed annually. I think this bill costs for these licenses to be renewed annually. Uh, is the expectation there's an application fee each time the license is renewed, as in the case with many other licenses that the Commerce Department oversees, or is it a one-time application fee, you've got your license, and so long as you keep it in good standing and up-to-date, you're good to go? Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. I, I, I do want to acknowledge that I'm, some of these questions, if you don't have it right at your fingertips, and that's that's fine. We can get um, get after to have that conversation. Uh, part of asking the questions during the committee is so that it's made you know publicly aware of the folks to folks that we have some of these questions and that we may or may not have to get to them offline, and I, I find that perfectly reasonable. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. It looks like there is uh, an option for uh, a fee to cover uh, the cost of the application process uh, annually, uh, but I will verify that with you. That's that's our in our quick read. We found the line that says that. Uh, I believe it's uh, two hundred fifty dollars. It's Article One, Section Fourteen, Subdivision Four. So that's the section on license application and renewal application fees. It says the office may charge a fee not to exceed $250. So I think that's it. And is it one time? That's for renewal. Sorry, Chair. Mr. Hudala. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just looking through this quickly. It appears that for um, the lower potency edible product retailer operations, I believe there is an annual $250 fee. Um, just give me one, one, one moment to confirm that. Uh, yes, licenses must be renewed annually. The office may charge an application fee not to exceed $250 to cover costs associated with reviewing the applications. Very good. Thank you. I forgot about that useful asset we have over there, so thank you. <laughs> Senator Duckworth. Uh, uh, page 31 of the original bill. Uh, oh, I'm actually going to skip that because uh, Senator Rasmussen addressed that with one of his amendments. On page 33, um, it talks about upon the receipt of a completed application fee, the office shall forward a copy of the application to a local unit of government in which the business intends to operate. And uh, in, in essence, it has to comply with local zoning ordinances. And this gets to a comment I made earlier. I, I need some clarity here. Do local governments have the ability to regulate this? Do they not? Uh, this seems to be a little bit of a contradiction uh, given our earlier discussion. Ms. Fatay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. Local governments get to use reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions the way you know their typical land use authority would allow them to. So they are prohibited from completely zoning out the possibility, using their land use authority to completely zone out any cannabis business from being able to operate within their boundaries, but they absolutely can use reasonable time, place, and manner um, restrictions as they would with other businesses. So to ensure that everything is not clumped up in just one area of land use so that they can, you know, um, account for that. And then 
Local governments also have authorities throughout the bill to further regulate things like public consumption, licensing of on-site consumption at events. So there are other provisions in there. Um, you know, generally looking across the bill, the two things that local governments are precluded from having local control over is charging their own licensing fee and, again, completely um, banning these businesses from operating within their boundaries. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could you just elaborate as to why the very conscious decision to not allow cities to be able to charge some sort of a, a licensing or registration fee was put in the bill? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. That is strictly uh, to keep the cost low. Uh, if we, if the cost becomes exorbitant because each layer can add an additional fee on it, that gets passed on to consumers and can lead to a stronger black market. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> it's my understanding that there are many products in which um, cities are allowed to do that. Um, would you give consideration at some point, uh, since you obviously want to keep costs low, to maybe coming up with at least a modest fee that you or the office would be comfortable with city governments or, or counties or whoever uh, being able to charge so that they are able to um, generate maybe some revenue? I'm sure they're going to have to deal with some of these establishments uh, administratively. Personnel are going to have to work with them. Uh, so if there's just a minor a bit of revenue they can collect to offset some of the time that's going to be involved with working with these businesses and planning for them. I think they might find that to be helpful and at least a, a good faith effort to show them that uh, we're hearing their concerns. So it doesn't require you to agree, just throwing that out there for consideration. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Very open to continuing to have that conversation. Uh, I think we, in order to, to really get this bill not just past the legislature, but to be successful across the state of Minnesota, we need the buy-in of cities, counties, um, at, at, you know, and the people of Minnesota. And so absolutely can, willing to continue to have that conversation. Thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also notice under license selection criteria, it says that craft cultivation is a priority. The office shall prioritize issuance of micro business licenses. Could you tell me why that uh, that was prioritized in the bill? Uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein uh, and Senator Duckworth. Uh, essentially to make sure that the small businesses, the individual folks who are in Minnesota are able to be the priority. Um, we know that there are large multinational um, or multi-state uh, companies out there right now, and we do not want the market in Minnesota to be just immediately opened up to huge outside corporations that can blanket the state in hundreds of stores immediately. Um, we want an opportunity for Minnesotans to build wealth, um, to build equity, and to, uh, to undo some of the harm that we have done through prohibition to communities in Minnesota. Um, so that craft, sort of the, the lens towards that is to ensure that the office, you know, the, the priority, the people who might have the plan in on day one with every piece of it put together 100% and have a plan for 100 stores, those are gonna be the guys who've done this 100 times in other states. We wanna ensure that a priority is for Minnesota-owned businesses run by Minnesotans who are able to, to get their foot in the door in this industry. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and I appreciate the sentiment. I see pros and cons to the scenario you just laid out, if it's a, a larger company that maybe has a lot of experience doing this, a lot of knowledge, um, maybe uh, there could be less uh, issues regarding implementation if they're able to do it quickly on a large scale, maybe that's good for price, maybe it brings it down. Um, but I understand what you've shared and um, just was curious as to why that was being prioritized. <coughs> um, I have another question regarding uh, what's referenced on here or in the bill, it says the office shall utilize a lottery to randomly select licensed recipients from among entities. That's if it, you know, if there begins to be a competition. How many licenses 
do we think are initially going to be requested and issued? How many are we looking at? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Uh, that is under the purview of the office, and, and the way it's written into the bill is enough to meet demand. Um, so I don't have I don't have a number for you. Um, I imagine that as this office gets set up, uh, that's among the first things that they have to do is uh, do some studies and do some research to figure out what the demand will be. Um, but that will be under their purview. Okay, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. Just below that, there's a, a section entitled Inspection, License Violations and Penalties. Um, and one of the lines uh, says that the office, given their authority, will have the ability to question privately any employer, owner, operator, agent, and employee or employee of a cannabis business. Um, now, is this being done by officers or representatives of the office? Is it being done by traditional law enforcement? Really. What I'm trying to get at is, are we going to still be following all the typical legal um, procedures that, that we would all be familiar with as it relates to these establishments and inspections? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, much like the health administration has health inspectors that go out and, and check restaurants and things like that, um, labor has similar. This would be just like that under the Office of Cannabis. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just bear with me, please. Uh, on page 38, under complaints and reports, uh, priority of inspection, it states the office may conduct inspections of any licensed cannabis business at any time to ensure compliance with ownership and operation requirements of the chapter. Uh, is, is there an expectation that the office will be required to give notice, or is it they're showing up kind of whenever they want and the expectation is uh, they'll be allowed to conduct that inspection? Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. There is nothing written in, in the bill to require notice. Okay. Duckworth. Uh, it also, thank you, Mr. Chair. It also says the office shall make a special inspection as soon as practical to determine if such danger or violation exists. So my question there is, is the office obligated to let the local government and law enforcement know of the potential violation uh, that has been reported to them? Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Duckworth and Senator Klein, or Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Uh, <laughs> just promoted you. <laughs> um, it does not look to me. Uh, that there is a notification requirement, um, I would be happy to work with you to, to add that piece in. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Port. I think that's something that uh, is worthwhile to consider how that might play out and um, what might be best in that situation. I promise you I am eliminating questions as we go here. I'm, I'm using my best judgment. Uh, as we p turn to page 43, it talks about general requirements a license holder or applicant must meet each of the following. Uh, one of them listed, number 14, says uh, not an employee, or excuse me, that the business will not employ an individual who is disqualified from working for a cannabis business under this chapter. What disqualifies somebody from working at uh, one of these cannabis uh, businesses or locations? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Klein. Uh, and Senator Duckworth, uh, let us pull that up. There's a section on okay. it. Okay, if, if it's in the bill, that's fine. It is in the bill. There, so I, I only looked at the sections that pertain to us that were in that sheet. So if it's in another one, I understand. Mr. Chair, if I It may. is, an, and I can send that to you as okay. well, Senator Thank Duckworth. You. Senator Duckworth. Uh, this has to do with uh, licensing. It says is if, a, if the license holder or applicant is a business entity, every officer, director, manager, general partner, uh, of the business entity must meet each of the requirements of this section. So my question surrounding the uh, this is this. Is the license in the name of one owner? Is it in the name of all the owners? That's the first question I have. Ms. Fatay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth, the business entity can be the license holder, and when the business entity holds the license, then those requirements are required for each individual owner, general manager, co-op member, whatever it may be. 
Mr. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the answer. I, I gathered that from this. Um, I'll give you a scenario. Let's say that it's not going to be a business entity that owns it, right? Let's say that there's going to be a person, an individual, that is the applicant of the license and obtains the license. Does that person also have to be an owner of the business? Or could I hire somebody as the business owner and then utilize an employee or an officer of the business to then apply for the license in their name? Ms. Fatigue. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, I certainly hope that the bill is not written to allow that, so we will double check the language. I don't think it's written in a way okay. that well, uh, permits that. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's why I ask. Uh, I work in a, in a field in an industry where uh, licensing or, or applying for that license doesn't necessarily have to be done by the owner of the business or a business entity. It can be done by an employee or an officer of the business. And that would seem to circumvent or, or sidestep a lot of the criminal history aspects of these licenses. So I'd like to see that uh, addressed if it's not in here. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. I'm 99% sure that it is written to prevent that, but we will double check that. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on page 44, it talks about cannabis business general operation requirements and prohibitions. And one of the, uh, the subsections talks about for quality control, employees of a licensed cannabis business may sample cannabis products. Employees may not interact directly with customers for at least three hours after sampling products. And employees may not consume more than three samples in a single 24-hour period. This must be recorded in the statewide monitoring system. Um, so are, are employees going to be allowed to consume cannabis while at work and then allowed to drive home shortly thereafter? Or are there, are there other places in this bill where that's addressed? Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Klein and Senator Duckworth. Uh, two, two things I'll, I'll say about that. Um, first, it is under the same sort of uh, ideas uh, of quality assurance in other industries, uh, food, manufacturing, things like that, um, the same sort of quality assurance. Um, and also, in this bill, regardless of where, how, or from whom you consume cannabis, it is illegal to drive while impaired. And that, that would not be okayed if you're, you consumed it at work. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's why I, I raised the question. I understand quality control, but uh, I mean, I'd love to work at an ice cream parlor and taste test all the product, but I'd probably be able to drive home just okay, right? Uh, in this instance, if we're going to be uh, consuming or tasting product that potentially has the ability to uh, affect my level of uh, impairment, that's why I asked the question. And um, I always try to look at these bills and in my mind envision how they're going to play out realistically uh, in reality. If I'm a business owner, my employees are sampling product uh, while they're there working, well, they're gonna have to get home somehow. And so whether or not we're gonna require that business to then implement a policy that requires them to uh, seek a, a way home other than them driving or require that business to make sure that that's the case, that might be a safeguard that we consider if we're gonna allow folks to do this uh, at work on the job and then obviously expect them to head home at some point. Mr. Chair, if I may. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Duckworth. Um, another piece I want to acknowledge is that this bill is written to very strictly track the inventory that uh, exists in retail stores or manufacturing plants. Uh, it, it is very specific down to the plant, down to the ounce uh, that they must put in this inventory system. So um, to, to like the ice cream analogy, like that will be very difficult to happen because you will notice in your inventory and in the inventory that is required to be tracked and sent to the state that you are missing product. Um, and any that is quality, tested for quality assurance has to be tracked in a specific way. Um, any that is, you know, damaged or rotten has to be tracked in a specific way and disposed of in a specific way. Like there are a lot of safeguards in this bill to ensure um, that that sort of 
pilfering that can happen in some industries does not happen in this industry. I, I would be happy to work with you to uh, see if, if we do need to require some sort of employees are, or employers are required to ensure that employees that, that consume product for quality assurance have a safe way home. Um, I, I would be happy to work with you on that. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, on page 50, uh, section 23, under cannabis manufacturer licensing, number two, it talks about uh, authorized actions. So a cannabis manufacturer license consistent with a specific license or endorsement entitles the license holder to, in this case, accept cannabis from unlicensed persons who are at least 21 years of age, provided that the cannabis manufacturer does not accept more than two ounces <coughs> from an individual on a single occasion. I'm just curious what that means and <coughs> in, in how they're able to acquire cannabis from an unlicensed person and if that's even legal. Uh, Ms. Fatih. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, that provision um, is to cover the uh, the allowance for home grow, the ability of people to um, grow cannabis and anything under two ounces, it is permissible to gift without remuneration to uh, someone who's over the age of 21. So if I can ask a follow-up, Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth. Thank you. So I, I want to make sure I understand that correctly. Uh, are you saying that a cannabis manufacturer can accept homegrown product from anybody in the state who may be unlicensed so long as it's not more than two ounces? Ms. Uh Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, they can accept it for their own personal use and not lose their license. There is a provision ah. in the bill that says that you cannot sell uh, flour that has been grown by uh, uh, an unlicensed grower. So it's just, it's meaning that if you have a license and you are gifted something under the threshold um, that is allowed for that, it does not jeopardize your, your license. Okay, Mr. Chair, if I may. Senator Duckworth. So this would be more of a, a personal thing. Okay, is that currently allowed under state statute? I, don't, I guess I don't know. Ms. Fatih. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, under current, I mean, we don't have uh, laws that allow for like growing and gifting of, of cannabis under current law. Um, mm -hmm. We can find for you what the current criminal thresholds are. But in this bill, yes, it would allow, this bill has provisions that allow for home growth. So you can have up to eight plants, four of which are flowering at any given time. Mm -hmm. And then there are provisions that lay out depending on what it is, whether it's flour, concentrate, whatever, how much you can gift to someone over the age of 21 without remuneration. So this is just to say that somebody that is a licensed manufacturer, that's something that they do outside the practice of their manufacturer, their licensed manufacturer, that that wouldn't disqualify them. Okay, Senator Duckworth. Uh, so just a quick follow-up on that then. So somewhere in this bill, it, it, it legalizes or allows people who might grow their own product to give it to other people so long as they're 21 or older and it's under two ounces. Anybody could do that if you grow your own stuff at home. Ms. Fatehi. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, that is correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Senator Duckworth. Uh, I appreciate it. That portion makes a lot more sense now. Uh, On um, page 53, um, it talks about a manufacturer and a plan for safe storage and disposal of hazardous substances, including but not limited to any volatile chemicals. I'm just curious, when we're licensing places of business to do this, what sort of hazard substances or volatile chemicals uh, are we talking about? Ms. Fatih. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, I'd be happy to have an expert that does extraction and processing reach out to you to talk specifically about the type of 
chemicals that they use. I was just at an extraction plant yesterday. They have, you know, different types of, they use butane for certain things. They use ethanol for certain things. It's a scientific process. Um, so they have various solvents that need to be stored appropriately. Um, just ensures that they do. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate that. And I asked, number one, because I was curious. That obviously, that catches someone's attention. The second reason I ask is, uh, as a volunteer member of the Lakeville Fire Department, we train, in, we train in hazmat operations. And we have to understand what local businesses have certain chemicals or substances like are being described here. So um, if it's just some, get, to give some thought to this bill, uh, a mechanism that would ensure that whatever local municipality these places are in, they have awareness of whatever these chemicals might be, or, the, or that we're having awareness of what we're allowing to be in these communities and how potentially volatile they are. Maybe they're really not of that much concern, but if they are, uh, local units of government and, and first responders should probably know about it. And then the second question it would lead me to ask is, and that, this is rhetorical, uh, would that uh, dictate where we're allowing these facilities to be? And maybe that's covered in zoning. So again, rhetorical. Unless you'd like to add, unless you'd like to add something, members of the committee, um, if I could direct your attention to uh, page 13, line 20, where under definitions, volatile solvent is defined for us and, and includes the specific chemicals that are being referenced here. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Um, if I may, uh, thank you. On page 55, it talks about municipal or count or county cannabis store. So I would imagine they're uh, grateful they can maybe compete in this uh, endeavor. Um, but I, I just want to make sure I understand this. They can establish, own, operate um, this, this type of a business, but they can't license, manage, or regulate it at their level, other than maybe zoning. Senator Port. That's correct. Okay. Senator Port. Uh, page, thank you, Mr. Chair. On page 56, under cannabis retail operations, uh, there is a portion that says a cannabis retailer may sell up to two ounces of adult use cannabis flour. Could you give us a sense of what is two ounces? Uh, how much product, how long does that last you? How much would that maybe meet the needs of somebody who's, who's looking to utilize this product? And the follow-up to that is, is it an amount of product that could be divvied up and then redistributed or sold to other people, and if someone decided to do that, would that be illegal or illegal? Ms. Fatay. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, I imagine it would depend on what your level of consumption is, same as, like, if you buy a fifth of vodka, it may take someone a couple hours, it may take someone a week, I don't know. It uh, would be individualized. These um, amounts are based on consultation with what we see in other states um, and pegged to, you know, what is some of the guidances that we've seen there in terms of what they have found to be acceptable from a public health standpoint. In terms of whether it would be illegal, um, the bill has criminal provisions that indicate, you know, what level um, of distribution. Um, but anything under two ounces is acceptable for transport, you know, use and possession. Personally, I don't off the top of my head remember what the limits are for sale. Um, Mr. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The reason I ask is uh, I had a business owner. Well, you heard the city administrator from the city of Lakeville here earlier, and he talked about we have some of the, we have some businesses are, are already kind of dabbling in, uh, not quite this, but something that's similar. And the business owner asked me to meet with him, and he said, I don't quite think people know just how much two ounces is. And that's why I asked. He seemed, to, he seemed somewhat concerned. This is somebody who's seeking to get into this line of work. He seemed to be somewhat concerned uh, that that was, to him, it seemed like a lot. Um, and I did some Googling myself. If you look at my Google search history, you might think I have some problems uh, as I was preparing for this meeting. Uh, but according to what I was able to find, just to give people some sort of reference or context, uh, it was, uh, at least according to some sources online, that one ounce would be enough to potentially allow you to uh, create 84 
um, 84 joints that you could smoke. So my question, or why I asked the question was, how much are we allowing people to purchase and then are we giving consideration to what they might choose to do with that if there are large amounts? And then my follow-up is, they may sell up to two ounces of adult cannabis. Is it per visit, per day? How often can they sell an individual two ounces worth? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, I, I think a helpful way to think about this is I, I enjoy wine. I like wine. I don't always like the same kind of wine. I, I buy different bottles of wine, different kinds of wine. Um, I have a collection of wine at home. Uh, and I don't go to the store every time I want a bottle of wine. I go every once in a while and maybe we'll pick up a whole bunch. And then it'll be at home for me to drink when I want. I also sometimes take a bottle of wine over to my friend's house and either gift it to them or drink it with them. All of that is my decision because alcohol is a legal product. Uh, that's what we're doing with this bill. It is adult use cannabis. We have put limits on it, on what you can sell at a time, um, which we don't really do for alcohol. I could go and spend thousands of dollars at Total Wine and they would just keep ringing me up. Um, but we do put limits on it in this bill. We also put limits on what you can possess at your home. And so it's a large amount, five pounds. Um, but that is still a limit that we don't put on other legal substances. And if what we're trying to do is decriminalize, we have to get out of the mindset that having the product is a problem. Uh, because people will consume the product differently than you do. People will consume differently than I do. People consume alcohol differently than I do. I, I really like wine, but I don't drink that much. Uh, I, I, often go for weeks at a time without having a glass. And sometimes I have two when I get home from work, maybe like tonight. <laughs> but it is, I, I think like it has to be, with this bill comes the policy and comes the regulations, but also has to come a shift in our thinking. The way that we have criminalized cannabis has had immeasurable harm on our communities. It has also probably, in some instances, protected people from something, right? Like there are gives and takes in our laws all the time. And a, a thing I would like to sort of ground us in is that I hope as we move through this conversation, and I certainly think, Senator Duckworth, that your questions have been very, well-meaning and like in hopes to make this bill better. And, and I appreciate that. And, and I in no way am trying to say that that is not true of you. But I hope that we can start to shift our thinking about the, the stigma that we have on cannabis because it is harmful to people. Um, and it is harmful for people who need this product and who have needed this product for medical reasons, um, for health reasons. And, and now if we are talking about legalizing, we are all going to need to get to a place where we aren't looking down or making opinions about people based on how they use a legal product. Senator um, Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, if my question implied that, um, I, I guess I'm not sure how it did. Um, uh, simply asking about various amounts under this license, how much can they give, how frequently, uh, things of that nature. I'm also curious, uh, are there other states out there that allow for people to purchase um, over two ounces or, or, or two ounces, or what, what kind of seems to be the standard amount that, that some states have implemented? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. This is sort of an average um, of what other states have. Michigan has no limit on what you can 
own. I think they have a limit on what you can buy at a time, but no limit on what you can have. Um, so we took sort of a, a, an average um, of what many of the other states have. Senator Duckworth. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On page 58, um, there is a line in here that talks about uh, posting of notices and something that says, a statement that operating a motor vehicle under the influence of intoxicating uh, cannabis is illegal. Um, and I guess this gets back to one of the amendments we discussed earlier. Um, if an employee of one of these businesses were to operate a motor vehicle while under the influence, uh, can that business be held liable or responsible for their actions? Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. I guess I, I would have a question that um, there are people that work at breweries and distilleries now that uh, quality control tests the product and maybe also tests the product not for quality control. Um, I don't know the answer to this. Do we hold them liable? Senator Duckworth. Uh, I don't know. Is that going to be a, a follow-up at some point? Or my question is you know, the uh, insurance was an issue that was brought up earlier and how these businesses may not be able to be held responsible. So I'm just seeking clarification for another industry under com the commerce regulates so that we understand exactly what's going to be expected of these businesses and their employees. Senator Port. I, thank you, Senator Klein and Senator Duckworth. I can take a look into that. My, I, I don't believe we hold those businesses liable. It, you will have to be 21 to consume these products. You will have to be 21 to work in these stores or to go into them to buy things. Um, at that point, you're an adult who's responsible for your own behavior uh, would be my understanding of it, but I'd be happy to look into it. Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, thank you, Senator Port. As uh, those of us that have worked in the industry of insurance and liability can tell you, an employee um, causing damage negligently while in the course of scope of their employment does generally bind the employer to be liable. Um, however, I thought in your example, maybe the employee was not in the course and scope of their employment. So uh, hurting somebody, damaging property while you're working for somebody, the employer is generally held responsible under Minnesota law. Thanks very much. Glad to contribute. Great seeing you. <laughs> Senator Duckworth. Always glad to have uh, experts on the committee. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Fritz. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I have a question that relates to the conversation that we've been having, and maybe it's somewhere else in the bill. Uh, how much is a person legally able or legally permitted to possess on their person at any given time under this bill? Is it two ounces? Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. On their person, two ounces, yes. Uh, in their private residence, up to five pounds. That's a flower. It's different if it's the distilled oil or. I'm going to pretend to know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on page 64, it talks about randomized deliveries. A cannabis transporter shall ensure that all delivery times and routes are randomized. Um, I'm just curious, is this realistic? What does this look like? What are we expecting these businesses to do? What meets the definition of a randomized delivery? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, this is similar to uh, like the armored cars that pick up uh, bank deposit, deposits from, they don't drive the same route every day. Uh, they randomize their driving for safety and security. Um, this is a fairly common practice in, in the transporting industry. Senator Duck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, that, that leads me to my next question, because uh, I noticed in addition to having to have randomized deliveries, it also says that these deliveries must be staffed with a minimum of two employees. At least one delivery team member shall remain in the motor vehicle at any time. Uh, I'm just obviously, there's a reason for it. Has this been an issue in other states? Uh, what, what, what is leading to this language being included in the bill? Senator Boyd. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. This is, uh, has been common language in other states, and this is similar to um, exactly like the armored car. If there is product that you don't want stolen uh, that is valuable or could be harmful to the community, you have another person uh, in the vehicle. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And a, a question, and maybe it's dovetailing off of the transportation security requirements in the bill, 
Would a cannabis business operating in Minnesota under the framework of this bill be able to open a bank account in the state of Minnesota, or would they have to deal exclusively in cash? Ms. Fatigue. Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen, this bill does not have specific um, provisions for creating a banking system for cannabis. Um, there are a variety of different ways that the industry um, has figured out to um, work sometimes on cash basis, sometimes there are even different types of payment processors that are able to, um, you know, they have workarounds uh, for that. And then we do actually in Minnesota have uh, uh, some of the more um, innovative and active banking practices around cannabis. So we have credit unions and, and such that uh, are able to operate locally without uh, getting in a, you know, some of the federal issues. So um, the bill, however, does not create a banking system. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just think this is an important question, especially for the Commerce Committee. You know, we um, pass legislation that regulates both state chartered banks and state chartered credit unions. And so I guess my question, um, Mr. Chair, is, you know, would a cannabis business be able to open a bank account at a state chartered bank or a state chartered credit union under Minnesota law? Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Klein and Chair Rasmussen. Um, I've learned a lot of this bill, but I don't know banking law. I'd ha I'll have to get back to you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On page 67, it talks about uh, a cannabis micro business, their licensing and what it would allow them to do. It says they can operate an establishment that permits on-site consumption of edible cannab uh, cannabinoid products. And so my question is this, I think for a lot of folks, and I'll speak for myself, when we talk about the legalizing of marijuana, we think about, um, you know, you're able to purchase a modest amount and you can enjoy it in the use of your home or, or what have you. This seems to potentially uh, change or alter that, that perception that you're going to a place of business uh, to consume and then obviously at that point having to return home. So I'm just wondering, what safety measures are in place or what thought has been given to the fact that with this license, uh, folks are going to be allowed to go to a site, uh, consume marijuana, and then potentially uh, drive home, knowing that sometimes the effect of, of marijuana doesn't necessarily kick in uh, for some time or that some people may react to it differently. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. I, you know, I would raise the same comparison to alcohol. Yep. We have bars and uh, concert events and things like that where you consume, can consume alcohol and you need to leave them at some point um, and get home. Uh, people do a variety of things, you know, have a sober driver, take a Lyft, take an Uber, um, things like that. Uh, this is the same. It is not illegal uh, to drive after having had alcohol, it is illegal to drive while being impaired. Um, and, and the same is true of cannabis. So, uh, you know, we, we should hold it to the same standard. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And we might have to defer to a legal expert again. Um, I seem to recall hearing of instances, I'll stick with your alcohol example, where a bar, the argument could be made, um, an employee of the bar uh, continue to serve somebody beyond the point that they should no longer have continued to serve them. Yep. Um, and I could imagine a very similar scenario. And I've seen language in the bill that kind of relates to that. So my question is, how do we prevent that? And or if there is an instance in which a convincing argument can be made or there's evidence that shows that that happened, is that business held responsible? Do they lose their license? Are they prevented from getting a license in the future? Uh, curious to get your, your thoughts on something like that. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator. I didn't mean to jump in front of the author if she preferred to respond, but there is an answer under current Minnesota Dram Shop Law. Senator, I'd be happy to share you the basics if you want. Senator Frentz. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, the way the Dram Shop Law works is that one of the ways a place that is licensed to serve alcohol can be held responsible is if they uh, fail to avoid serving someone that's obviously intoxicated. We see these cases where um, the testimony is the person was slurring their speech or bloodshot eyes or obviously intoxicated. That's the standard. And if the bar 
serves that person knowing they were obviously intoxicated or should have known, and then alcohol is shown to be a factor in the, the accident or the damage, then the bar can be held responsible under dram shop insurance coverage. And I would presume um, the operation of law here in Minnesota for this bill would, would be similar. There's a duty on a, a seller of intoxicating beverage or an intoxicating substance to uh, not serve someone. And if you do serve someone who you should have known was already intoxicated, I think there would be an argument um, you've exposed yourself to civil liability. Just my two cents, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Klein, uh, Chair Klein, and Senator Duckworth. Um, as you said, there are provisions in the bill that say you cannot um, <coughs> sell to an obviously uh, intoxicated client, um, and so that is covered in here. I am almost positive that there are legal ramifications to that, but I will look those up and get back to you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you to everybody who weighed on, uh, on that one, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I look on page 69, it talks about um, what a cannabis micro business may not do. And one of those is to, per, uh, to permit an individual who is under 21 years of age to enter the premise. And so is the expectation here that these businesses are going to be carting folks at the door, or how do we expect that they're going to implement that um, when, when folks are, or potentially underage folks are trying to enter these businesses? Senator, uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Chair, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. I imagine that some of those rules will come with the agency in their, their rulemaking provisions, but I would imagine it will be similar to how liquor stores do it. Um, you know, a large sign posted on the door potentially um, with staff around able to card. Um, some may choose to, to put someone at the door, um, but the agency or the, the office will be required to specify those rules. Senator Friends? I can't resist, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator, again. Um, we were discussing earlier the illegal sale to someone who was obviously intoxicated and the civil liability that results under Minnesota law for alcohol. An illegal sale is also someone who is under the legal drinking age, same operation of law, just a different type of way it's an illegal sale. Presumably that liability places responsibility on the seller to make sure they're not selling to someone who's under. Thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Port and Senator Fritz. One more question in regard to this uh, part of the bill. It talks about how that the micro business may not sell more than one single serving of an edible cannaboy, uh, cannabinoid product to a, a customer. Could you help me understand or give me some context to what is considered uh, one single serving? Is it just one thing that you eat? Is it a package? What, what's a single serving? Ms. Fate. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, I will for the low dose. For yep, so the mm -hmm. no, this so this is a dolly, so it's one out of all serving, so ten milligrams. Ten milligrams, yeah. Um Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. If it is a uh, establishment that is selling the low potency edible products, one serving would be five milligrams. If it is a license that permits an adult use dosage, one serving is 10 milligrams. Okay. Same as would be required for the product if it's being sold for off-site consumption. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, and, and could you or your, your helper over there maybe give me a, an idea of like what is that in actuality? Is it a, if I'm buying edibles, is that a, I'm buying a package of stuff? That's a single serving. Am I buying a box of it? Am I going to Costco and getting my month's worth? Uh, just just trying to get some context of, of what that actually means. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and, and Senator Duckworth. They're all, they are required to be packaged individually. So like she said, there are limits for uh, the low potency is five milligrams uh, in a single serving. So if you're talking about like a gummy, mm -hmm. that will be one gummy. There will be a dish. There can be additional gummies in the bag up to a certain 25, 25 uh, milligrams. Uh, you know, so there, there are, and that would be sealed in an, in a different bag that is resealable. Um, all of the pieces have to, but those are all, all laid out. 
Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. I now want to turn to some questions regarding uh, cannabis event organizer operations. It's on page 71. Um, the first subdivision talks about local approval. It says a cannabis event organizer must receive local approval. Um, so I appreciate some aspect of local control here. It seems like they can say no. Uh, can, can that local unit of government put any restrictions on where these events may be held? And while we're on the topic of these events, if you could just give me an idea of what, what, uh, what is a cannabis event or what, 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 what might a community expect if, if someone's going to be able to have a cannabis event there. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Um, yes, the, the local government can put restrictions on that. They can grant or not grant a license. This is the one area where they really have sort of full control on whether they have these or not. Um, I will defer to Laylee to uh, talk about the events. We can also, at future uh, committees, bring in people who run events like this. Ms. Fetty. interest. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, that's correct. The local government is able to say no or, I mean, provide um, restrictions on where these events are um, happening. Uh, the only, you know, there's some provisions that, you know, say, for example, that if you're going to have a, uh, an event where smoking of like flour, vaping, it does specify that if the local government does decide to allow that, it needs to be somewhere where it's not visible to the public. So, you know, there are those kinds of things where it adds additional layers of protection, but it leaves it generally open. In terms of what a cannabis um, event might be, it could be, I mean, all sorts of things. It could be a, a, a Music event. It could be an art event. I don't. I don't think the bill specifies what. A, okay, what Senator it Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That, well, that leads me to my next question because it talks about uh, cannabis event on-site consumption, whether it's a festival, concert, what have you. My question is, if if the event is held indoors, are there any ventilation requirements? Uh, Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Yes, the Clean Air Act uh, is still in effect. So they would have to meet the requirements that are required for the Indoor Clean Air Act. Senator Duckworth. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I'm not familiar with that act. Could you just give me a quick synopsis of what sort of ventilation requirements we could expect uh, when it comes to uh, cannabis being utilized indoors at some of these events? And this may stray into um, the Department of Health, but uh, I'll allow it, Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. I can look that up. Um, I don't know. I wasn't here when the Clean Air Act passed, but I know there are a number of restrictions uh, that, that require certain ventilation if smoke is going to be around and, and certain requirements for that. I can, I can look at what those are. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On page 75, it talks about cannabis delivery service operations. Um, in, this is section 38. It says, prior to completing a delivery, a cannabis delivery service shall verify that the customer is at least 21 years of age or is enrolled in a registry program. So I guess I'm just trying to conceptualize what we're talking about here. I mean, are, are folks going to be allowed to, from their home, uh, put in an order for cannabis and then just gets dropped off at their house like DoorDash, kind of? And if that's the case, I'm wondering how or in what ways the office is enforcing that people are truly of age if they can simply order something online or over the phone and it shows up on their doorstep. Ms. Fatehi. Senator Klein, Senator Duckworth, right now what we see a lot of the um, businesses that are selling the legal low-dose hemp-derived products used, there are... Um, software platforms that require, you know, taking a photo of the ID and then a photograph with you holding the ID. And then when the person shows up, you've got to show them the ID and your face, and then they compare it to what it is that you've sent. So there are um, best practices for this. And I imagine that part, I mean, part of the, the benefit of bringing this under a more robust regulatory system is you will have an office that is able to promulgate rules mm -hmm. um, that address these 
kinds of questions and issues with specificity given the statutory mandate that they have to protect public health and safety mm -hmm. and to make sure people under the age of 21 are not getting access to these products. And Senator Duckworth, could I just uh, interject and ask, uh, you know, we're getting towards the evening hour here. People will need to make plans for their evening and for dinner, et cetera. And uh, if you could give us an indication or an, an estimate as to how much further your questioning uh, plans to go. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I have fewer than 10 questions left. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody indulging me. Um, I understand this law is likely, uh, this bill is likely to become law. So uh, I'm taking my due diligence extremely seriously, and I know it can be frustrating and annoying, but that, that's where this is coming from. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate your indulgence. I really do. Uh, so this, this aspect of the bill is something that I do find particularly concerning. Uh, someone who has uh, participated in online uh, wagering, I know that there are ways to verify identification like you described, uh, but I don't necessarily see it spelled out in the bill. Um, and whether we're just going to leave that up to the office or what have you, a recommendation I would make or a hope that I would have is that we more clearly spell out exactly how businesses, if they're going to get this license, are expected to verify that if they're just going to simply drop off product at a home, that the person who at least, at the very least, ordered it was of age or belonged to some sort of registry program that allows them to do so. Because I could very easily see this being circumvented or sidestepped. Uh, that's why I bring up that question. Senator Porter. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. I'd be happy to, to work with you on the wording around that. Um, our intent is to have it be uh, very strong, um, and I, I'm happy to work with you on that. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on page 104, it talks about packaging prohibitions. Um, and it says that a package must not uh, be must not be packaged in a manner that bears a reasonable resemblance to any commercially available product that does not contain cannabinoids, et cetera. What I'm what I'm asking here is: Is this getting to the you can't have packaging that looks like uh, candy that you might be similar, you know, already familiar with? I see heads nodding. That satisfies. Thank you, Senator uh, Duckworth. Uh, moving on to page 105, um, again talks about the maximum dose consumptions, um, the following statement, keep this product out of the reach of children. Some of our amendments may have already solved this problem, uh, but I, I, I'm just, I'm wondering, much like if someone were to, to purchase cigarettes, is there any sort of Surgeon General's warning or is there any intent that the office is mandating that there will be warnings on the packaging of all of these items that are being sold? <laughs> Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Uh, there is continued conversation uh, with the Department of Health, and uh, we are we are continuing to have this. I also thank some of the amendments we took earlier, and the other body has also adopted some amendments along that line. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Crossed off a few questions that were covered by amendments that you accepted earlier, so thank you. Um, on page... Oh. We have, that was the insurance one. Give me one minute, Mr. Chair, please. Just have to flip to the appropriate page. So this is, might be a more simple question. Uh, page 176 and elsewhere in the bill, it talks about compacts. The governor has purview to enter into compacts. Uh, could you tell me what that is? What the purpose? I don't even know what that means. So I'm just trying to get some awareness there. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Uh, those are agreements between the governor and tribal nations. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. So what would be like an example or what would be the purpose of a compact? Senator Port. What purpose would it serve? Oh, uh, sure. Senator Klein, uh, Senator Duckworth. Um, I mean, like any agreement, a, a trade agreement, an agreement. Um, uh, we have an agree a compact on the medical licensure program right now. Um, they are sovereign nations. Uh, our, our tribes are sovereign nations. So it's sort of uh, some sort of a compact between the, uh, an agreement uh, between the two governments. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Um, getting So I'm going to wrap up here with just a few more that are more overarching questions for you, sure. if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first one is, it, anywhere in this bill, is the office required to conduct any studies that would analyze the impact of this uh, legislation and how it's implemented and the impact it has here in Minnesota? Senator Port. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Klein and Senator Duckworth. Yes, there are multiple studies. Uh, they sort of run the gamut of what the health aspects are, what the health effects are, um, what the usage level is. Uh, there, there's a wide variety, and all of them have studies that are required to be delivered to us. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Uh, last question is, well, it's a two-parter, though. Uh, is this bill come before education at all? It, it will? Okay. Sure does. I'll save it for then. Both education. Uh, I will save it for then. So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Port, and your lovely helper up there, thank you very much for uh, indulging my questions. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, wish you success in crafting the best, safest bill we possibly can for the people of Minnesota if this becomes law. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have one final question. Um, in the bill, and I'm looking at page 32, but it's in the bill uh, in several places. It, and again, this is referring to the labor peace agreement. And the reason I ask a question on it is this is a very unique thing that I've never seen in legislation that, that's come uh, before this committee. It, it says here, at a minimum, any application to obtain or renew a license shall include the following information if applicable. And then down at item number 10, it says an attestation signed by a bona fide labor organization stating that the applicant has entered into a labor peace agreement. And so I have a pretty simple question. I just wanna make sure I'm reading that correctly. Um, I think this you know, is a yes or no question, hopefully. Um, if, if a cannabis business or prospective cannabis uh, business in Minnesota refuses to negotiate a labor peace agreement with a labor organization, does it effectively lose the right to do business in Minnesota? Ms. Fatih. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen, I will have to get you an answer from somebody that understands Minnesota labor law better than uh, I do, and I think it probably hits a couple committees that have jurisdiction over labor questions. We will this. be sending this bill to the Labor Committee, yes. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do think that's a, a very important question because how I read the bill that, you know, if you had a Minnesota cannabis business that, that refused, um, for whatever reason, to uh, enter into an agreement that's stated here, they would not have any ability to operate in Minnesota. Uh, they would not be able to be either granted an initial license or even obtain a renewal. So I just think that's an important thing for um, us to understand as this bill moves through the process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Are there other questions or comments from members? Seeing none, uh, I will offer some closing comments on the bill, then we'll go to the author, and then we'll go to a motion. Um, thank you, members, very, very much for a long day of what I think is authentic and earnest bipartisan uh, work on this important bill. I concur with Senator Duckworth that this is likely to become law. This is our one day and our one chance to make it the safest and best uh, recre or adult use cannabis bill uh, in America, and I think we've uh, gone a long way towards uh, making that work. Uh, appreciate the diligent questions and the effort that went into developing those. Uh, Senator Rasmussen, thank you for your bipartisan work in developing amendments that made this bill better. To the author, thank you for continuing to work with uh, members of both parties to uh, move this bill forward and improve it along the way. Um, and those are my comments. Thank you again, members, and to the author. Thank you, Chair Klein and members. Um, I, I do appreciate you giving your whole afternoon to this. It is a big piece of legislation and it is important. Um, so I appreciate your time, your constructive uh, comments and questions. I think we made a lot of progress today. Um, and while this is the one stop in the Commerce Committee, I go to every committee except for two, so I will see you all again another time at least. Um, so I look forward to you know continued engagement, and even if I'm not in your committee, if you have suggestions uh, for the bill or questions about the bill, please reach out to me and my office. And thank you to Ms. Fatehi and to all the testifiers today who, who came and showed their support for the bill. Uh, Senator Seberger, would you like to move the bill? Uh, I move that the bill be... So moved. Sorry? Say so moved. So moved. The bill, the question is on the motion... Sorry? Roll call requested, roll call granted. The question is on the motion of Senator Seberger that Senate File 73 as amended be recommended to pass 
and be referred to the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Klein. Yes. Senator Seberger. Yes. Senator Dames. No. Senator Duckworth. No. Senator Frentz. Yes. Senator Wicklin. Yes. Senator Howe. Yes. Senator Latz. Senator Zhang. Yes. Senator Rasmussen. No. Senator Howe. Senator Latz. On the question of the motion, there are five ayes and three nays. The motion carries. Congratulations, Senator Port. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>